Good evening and welcome to Poker Night Live. Tonight is all about Texas Hold'em, no limit. Some of you will be visiting us um, because you play poker and you want to learn how to improve on your game and your technique. Some of you will be joining, it, joining us because you want to learn how to play the game of poker. Well, both of you have come to the right place. We are going to be watching Texas Hold'em all night. We're going to be watching it on the internet as it's played. There is a five minute delay, so our players can't see their opponent's cards because that would be cheating. To help us along the way, yes, it's a Dr. Tom and Night Nurse special. Hello, Doc. Hello. It's hello. been a while. It has been. They've been keeping us apart again, Michelle. I, I don't know, know why. I've missed you. When you said both of you, it did sound like there are only two viewers in the show. I, was, <laughs> did. I should point out All that two of you. <laughs> there are many, many more. Probably two at once. Are probably both watching types somewhere. of people. Yeah, Dr. that's quite right. I know what you mean. <laughs> well, Tom here will be commentating over all of the games we watch. He'll be letting us know what he thinks should be going on, what people are doing right, what people are doing wrong. But, of course, we want to hear from you guys at home. We answer your questions if you email us or text us. And you can also let us know what you think about the games we're watching. And if there's any other, anything else you'd like to ask us, well, why not? It's a friendly show. So, how can you contact us? You can text 62211. There it is, four for a pound. That's very cheap, isn't it? It's very cheap, Doc. You can email pokernightlive.co.uk. Oh, and you can phone. Why not have your say? 0906 200 70 80. And your message will be played live on the air so we can hear your lovely tones and answer your questions. We're going to be looking at tonight cash games. Don't worry if you don't know what these are, we'll be explaining these to you. We'll be looking at sit and go tournaments and we'll be looking at multi table tournaments as well. And this is going to be your area. Um, so if you don't mind uh, taking us around the tables we're going to be looking at tonight. Here's my big moment. Take me to the tables, please, Maestro. First game we've got here is a 25 50 cent cash game. And uh, snap it down in seat six, Swan Lee. Lots of regular faces there. Craven, who loves his wife. He loves his what? He does. He loves his wife. Well, uh, that's, that's absolutely lovely, Michelle. <laughs> uh, there's a $2 sit and go here. One of the couples of my heart have been warmed. Fast it's, bandit, fellow female. How does he feel about his wife, do you think? Well, he's a fast bandit. We've got a $10 sit and go here. Oh, is it? Mm -hmm. oh, how do you know? I was talking to her when I was uh, playing the other day. Ah, very interesting. And finally here we've got, you guessed it, green of green, it's the $10 multi-table tawny. There it is in all its glory. Mm. Excellent. Well, there are four different types of uh, games we're going to be watching. Well, three different types. And uh, four tables we're going to be concentrating on throughout the night. Um, now, all of the guys that we're watching um, have just gone onto the internet and found their way to a table, and we'll be looking at how they play. It's a great way to learn, actually. Absolutely fantastic. Cheap, good fun, and you get to be a TV star. You do, and I'll be playing a bit later on as well. At approximately 11 o'clock, I'm going to be playing in a tournament as our new Beat the Presenter um, feature, and we'll be showing that at 12. And uh, we'll be seeing what I'm doing right and wrong. I think mainly what I'm doing right. And Tom, you're going to be doing that tomorrow, aren't you, with Casper? That's right. Um, so you've got that to look forward to with an expert. And it's good to see the difference between somebody like me, who's been playing six or seven months, to somebody like Tom, who's been playing for, for years and years. So it's good to see the difference there as well. Anyway, we're going to start tonight with a multi-table tournament. This is our, um, <coughs> this is our big tourney. Yep. We could only see one table here, but players in this tournament are distributed across many tables. How many are there, Michelle? Uh, well, we've got 244 runners. Wow. Um, so that's going to be about, what's 244 divided by 8? Well, it's roughly 30. Mm, there you go. So 30 green tables. And uh, what's the top prize? Top prize is $732. Now, the top 20 places are paid. And there's 12 minute blinds. Now, some people were, won't know what that means, so if you wouldn't mind, Doc. All right, 12 minute blinds means that the blinds, the compulsory bets that players to the left of the button put in, you're about to see it happen now. There they are, clink, clink, 10 20. They start off at 10 20, nice and cheap, because everyone's got lots of chips, but every 12 minutes they go up, and that is the killer. That's what forces you to play with junk eventually if you haven't taken any chances earlier. So, Buffy be good, 
is one of our regular players, and because it's just kicked off, most of these players have got around about what they started with, which was 1,500 tournament chips. Don't be confused, that doesn't mean $1,500, doesn't mean 1,500 lira, doesn't mean 1,500 anything. But I thought poker was played for money. I hear you cry. Well, yes, but in this case, all the money, the $10 plus the $1 surcharge, goes into a prize pool. And the $1 surcharge comes out pretty quick. But the $10 remains. That's what they're playing for. And they just play with tournament chips that have no actual fixed value. But you do need to use them to win more tournament chips. So you are still around when the last 20 players are playing and get into the money. Those all get paid something. And uh, preferably, you take first spot. A flush there for Joker Ace. And he is home and dry. He can't be outdrawn. And that's a happy situation because he's going to raise. And I think Adis Let will find it difficult to put down. And there it is. Adis Let was dead, absolutely dead when he put his money in. Only a meteorite through the roof could have saved him. Um, so they've all paid $10. Mm -hmm. They've all been given 1,500 chips. Mm -hmm. And it's due to the death competition. So once they lose them chips, they're out. Yep. And obviously, they don't get their $10 back. Nope. Um, top 20 places are paid. Yep. And as they're knocked out, the tables are condensed until we're left with one final table. That's right, yeah. So mostly they'll be playing at a full table or there, thereabouts all the way through until the, near the end of the tournament. Although these days you do get uh, more and more commonly you get shootout tournaments where if there are 30 tables, say, uh, each table will play down just to one winner and then those players will be amalgamated into... Um, well, three tables then, if they're ten-handed tables. And uh, likewise, so you have to play short-handed poker to get near the money. OK, now, um, it's easy enough to learn the game of Texas Hold'em, isn't it? But becoming a winning player is uh, much more complicated. Um, now, as we've already seen, um, we have the force blinds, which are put in to the left of the dealer button. Um, on Joker Ace and Rokalia on them at the moment, 10.20. Now, those blinds will go up, won't they, in a tournament? Yep, they go up inexorably. Just like death and taxes, nothing you can do about it. And that's to uh, give the tournament a lifespan. That's right, yeah. Otherwise, as, those, as players got knocked out, the chip stacks would get bigger and bigger for each player. And in the end, you'd have two players there with colossal stacks. The thing would never finish. Uh, okay, so we have four round. We we have four different streets. We have um, pre-flop, so we have betting going on pre-flop. Flop being three cards in the middle, and uh, once everybody's bet is equal, we can move on. Correct. Yeah, that is the basic uh, rule of betting in Texas Hold'em. Oh, look, we've gone through the matrix. Oh, here we go. So this is one of the other tables on the MTV. MTT. MTV. <laughs> it's a different show. <laughs> And we've got Papa Smurf there. So we're on the, the first street at the moment, Papa Smurf, um, pre-flop. Um, so obviously the blinds, 10, 20. So every, if ever, anybody wants to play, they have to put in at least 20. And if they don't think their cards are good enough, they can just fold and it doesn't cost them anything. That's right. Uh, but they can raise at any time, can't they? They can, and we recommend that they do. We recommend that you raise at least um, a significant proportion of the time you play, rather than always calling. And why is this? Why do you think it is, Michelle? Um, well, I, we, we know that there's two ways to win. Um, you either have to have the best cards, mm -hmm. um, so that if it gets to, comes to a showdown, you're going to win because you've got the better cards, or you need to make your opponents believe you have a better hand um, by making a bet and pushing them off. Um, so using that, um, the reason you're gonna be, you want to be raising rather than calling is because if you do have the best hand, it accumulates more money in the pot, mm -hmm. and if you don't have the best hand, you want to push them off so you can take the pot there and then. I agree with you. Excellent, I got it right. And whereas if you're just calling, I suppose you're not really... You've got to have the best hand at showdown. If well, and if you've got the best hand, you should be raising, so That's it makes right. no sense to call. Although there are times when calling's okay, isn't there? Yeah, sure. I mean, if you've, if you've got a big hand uh, and you're worried about scaring people off, by all means, call. But it needs to be very big. Uh, no, very few Texas Hold'em hands are crackable, and none are crackable before the flop. And also, of course, sometimes you're genuinely going to be in a situation where you don't think you can make your opponent fold, but you like the chances of your hand making a big hand. If you've got, say, uh, four cards to a flush, you've got two hearts in your hand, there's two hearts on the board, and you're fairly sure that you can't persuade your opponent to put his hand down, 
uh, and he's put in a small bet against you, then a call mm -hmm. is better than a raise. Mm -hmm. And the reason is that uh, the pot is offering you attractive odds so that if you catch that flush, which won't happen all the time, but it, if you catch it, you will uh, take down a big pot for your investment in terms of a call. We well, don't mind if you didn't understand that. We will be talking a bit about odds a bit later on as well. Um, we're going to head over to a cash game now. Um, so let's go straight there. And uh, this is actually a good place to be um, to explain a bit more into poker. Um, because it's a cash game, it stays exactly the same. Um, so what do I mean by that, Tom? Well, the blinds don't go up. The blinds don't go up in the cash game. And uh, moreover, you can join or leave a cash game whenever you like. It's not like a tournament. In a tournament, once you've put your entry fee into the house's coffers, then if you get up and leave, you can't cash your chips in because <coughs> they're not worth anything. They're only tournament chips. Their only value is their ability to generate more and get you into those final paid positions. In a cash game, effectively, you are playing with money. Here it's done virtually, obviously, via plastic and internet chips. But uh, those are pieces of, of dollars there. 50 cents is the cost to call the big blind. Um, and when you've made your want, you can leave and uh, go and spend it, like any other job. Nialio there. So it's the best five cards. It's always a five card hand. Yep. So you can pick any of the five cards out of the seven if you make it um, to the last round. That's right. At the moment, they've only got five cards because we've only got as far as the flop. But uh, the turn in the river, fourth and fifth cards, will give them more choice. Okay, so your change, your change, your hand changes drastically pre-flop um, to post-flop. Mm, that's a big, big difference. Uh, mostly. If you don't catch the flop, you should be uh, thinking about folding your hand, unless, of course, you think you can bluff your opponents off it. But you get a lot of information all in one go when those three board cards come down. You can pretty much see the course of your hand. Have you made a hand? Have you missed a hand? Have you got a hand that with one card could turn into a, a big hand, like a flush draw? The turn and the river, well, a big hand on the flop is... Uh, quite often safe against one card and maybe safe against two cards. So as you say there, Michelle, everything happens on the flop. OK, so therefore, thinking of that, what is the point of the pre-flop raise? Well, that's a good question. Thank you. That's what um, I'm here for. I'm wondering what the answer is. Are you talking about the point? I know it's Am Night, but, you know, I like to, to dredge up any sorts of poker theory when it comes my way. Mm -hmm. Are you talking about when you say, what's the point of it? Are you saying, what's the point of a player putting in a raise? Or are you talking about, in the game of Texas Hold'em, why should we have a round of betting before the flop? Ooh. Ooh. Well, can you answer both? Well, I can definitely answer the, um, the easier one, <laughs> which is the one that's more commonly asked. Uh, yeah, why should you bet before the flop when you're going to get all that information in a minute? And, well, there are two answers, in fact. One is that in the long run, if you're sitting there with a big hand, let's say ace-king, which is not a huge hand, but not a bad hand at all, certainly a better than average hand. In the long run, although a significant proportion of the time you're going to end up losing the money you invested before the flop in your raise, in the long run you're going to win more. You're going to win more by creating a bigger pot, even though you haven't yet seen the flop. So some sorts of hands, the top hands, let's say big pairs and ace-king, maybe ace-queen in a loose game, you, you're quite happy to raise before the flop then. And a table finds it, it, its uh, usual raise, and it's usually either three or four times yeah, the blind. Yeah, that's it? right. So it's, uh, in this game, 25 cent, 50 cent game, if you put in a dollar fifty or two dollars, um, <clears throat> about 40% of the time, you're going to lose that amount. And about 60% of the time, you're going to win it. So in the long run, you're, you're happy to endure that variation because in the long run, you win more by putting in a raise before the flop than you would if you just called. So that's, that's a sort of simple reason why you do it. It's a good hand, and it's probably going to win the pot. But the more technical reason why you put raises in before the flop in poker is to control what's going to happen. Cool. I think there's going to be a big pot here with top pair kings and um, set of queens. Yeah. How's uh, G4 going to play it? Is he going to put in just a sly call here? It's a rainbow flop. He doesn't have to be worried about flush. And um, he's decided to raise. I may have uh, just done a little sly little call there to try and make out I haven't got much in hope that M. Cosgrove would bet at me again. It's interesting. It's either a bit of an amateur player or it's a great play. 
And I, I think the reason, well, let's assume it's a great play. When there's king four, what was it, three or something, king, queen, three, mm -hmm. three different suits, there's absolutely no draw possible there. So when g4 just calls, it doesn't look like he's drawing to a flush or a straight. And by calling, M. Cosgrove might say, hang on a minute, if he's just calling and there's no way he can improve, maybe he's got a monster. Mm. And uh, I wonder if that was what G4 worked out. And he said, well, I'll raise it because then M. Cos might think I'm bluffing. But who knows? Maybe it was just a tilty raise. Anyway, I was banging on about the technical reasons for raising before the flop. Yes, you were. And the most um, pressing reason is to reduce the field so that you're playing against fewer players. Because if you've, even got, if you've got a pair of aces and you let five people take the flop with you, then there's a very good chance someone is going to make a bigger hand than you. So that's one good reason, is to reduce the size of the field. Another one is to acquire position. It's very important in Texas Hold'em to play from late position, to be the one last to act on the flop and afterwards. Mm -hmm. And if you just call, say, uh, in late-ish but not final position, say where blocks is or Daz, he's still got the button. Blox has still got button two to his left. If he just calls, Daz and Craven might call. And now when the flop comes down, they're going to have position over blocks. They're going to be able to see what he does and act on it accordingly. If he raises before the flop, Daz and Craven might have to fold. And then any, any players that blocks finds himself playing against on the flop, he will have position over them. Look at this, Michelle. This is, unfor this is unfortunate for the aces. Now, this is where you think... Raising it right up with the aces early would have maybe got rid of Daz and therefore Bloxman have lost, but it's a very difficult one. It's a question we get in a lot, whether to slow play aces, meaning uh, just calling and pretending you haven't got that much so that people will bet at you so you can get more money out of them, or, um, or you know, betting it up straight away, because even though you do have the best hand pre-flop, and it's a wonderful hand, a pair of aces, at the same time, it is just one pair. And when that flop comes down, you know, your opponents could have two pair, they could have three of a kind. And they could have, um, if they do have a flush, it's very easy to see, obviously, so it's a, a bit more noticeable, but straight, they could be drawing to things, so it's a difficult one to know what to do with. I suppose you can go either way. You have to make decisions in poker, and the longer you play, the, the better your decisions become. Your judgment. I mean, there are, there are sort of clear textbook reasons why you should do one thing or another, but a lot of poker is you've just got to say, well, it looks like he's probably got this hand. Mm. I might be wrong, but you have to make decisions, otherwise you're just going to be playing passive poker where you are pushed around by the other players at the table. Ace King now for blocks. Oh, that's not a bad flop for him. When M. Cos has got a worse king, you're going to ask me why it's a worse king, aren't you? Yes, you are. I can see it in your eyes. <laughs> because M. Cos has got the 10 kicker, if nothing changes, although they've both got a pair of kings, it's the ace in Blox's hand that decides it, because that's higher than the ten in M. Cosses. And Texas Hold'em is very much a game of kickers, the side cards. Which is why you need to be careful about paying to see a flop with um, rag hands, therefore ace two, ace three, ace four, king four, king five. You can go all the way up to nine or ten as far as I'm concerned mm -hmm. and still call it rags. This is true, I generally don't play things like King 9. King 10, I might do it on the button for a steal, maybe. Yep. Me too. Mm. I must have been hanging around you for a while, Dr Tom. Things are... Slowly... Shaving off you onto me. <laughs> Filtering. What a lovely uh, image that produced. Three clubs on the board. Very important in Texas Hold'em to, to know what kind of hands boards look like they make there. And for anyone, there are three clubs on the board. Probably doesn't mean anyone's got a flush, although it's possible. You but, have to be wary of it. Uh, another club on the river basically means the whole hand then is about the flush. Who's got it and how strong is it? And really, unless you've got the ace of clubs in your hand, you can't be raising. You can call but you don't want to be raising without the nut flush there. Not in Hold'em. Um, I've got a question for you, actually. OK. Um, I asked Cass the same question, and it's because I did it in one of the multi-table tournaments I was playing the other day. Um, I had a set of jacks. I had two jacks. Yeah, and there was a jack on the flop. 
Great. Very good hand, but there was two hearts on the board. Okay. Now, automatically, without thinking, I then put in a bet mm -hmm. um, because I, I, I didn't want to give somebody a free card to make a flush. Mm -hmm. It was only me and one other player. So obviously the likelihood of them having a flush isn't that great. So should I have slow played it to try and get more money out of them? Do you remember how many chips each of you had relative to what was already in the pot at that I, point? I actually think we were relatively even stacked and the pot obviously was a quite low because we'd only come in from the, from the um, pre-flop bets, which um, I'd raised it, I think, four times, big blind. And do you remember if there was an overcard to your jack? Was there a king or an ace? No, or I had top set. Okay. Yeah, I'd have probably played it a bit quieter then. Mm. I mean, I, I'm not a massive fan of slow playing. I'll do it, but I don't do it automatically. I think the question you've got to ask yourself, you, you asked the first important question, which was, is there a draw he could make? Is my set in trouble? Mm -hmm. And you're quite right there, Michelle, when you said, well, with one player in, it's pretty unlikely he's got the flush draw. Um, now, the second question you ask yourself is, will he call me if I bet? And if that's the case... I will bet even if there's no draw, because I want to pump that pot. Mm. But in that situation, if there's no ace or king, I think when your hand is looking safe and he mm. might, well not have, uh, might well have completely missed the flop, I'd have given him a free card. Yeah, so I think looking back on it, that's what, that's what, if I'd thought about it, I would have done. But because I acted on impulse very quickly, it's like, oh, two hearts, he could have two hearts, so I don't want to give him a free hand, get the flush, raise it up. And of course he folded, and I think I probably could have made more, more money there. You never know, Misha. Maybe he was a player who was never, ever going to call unless he made a hand that was, was anyway. going to beat you. you know? mm. So you're never doing anything terribly wrong if you bet and take a pot. OK, well, thanks, Doc. I shall keep that in mind. Do. We're going to do what's in the hole. <laughs> Fantastic. Here we go. <laughs> oh, we've got music. Oh, I've never heard that funky music before. But where's our little theme tune for what's in the hole gone? Have you heard Trev's theme tune? For what's in the hole. Tragic trip. Yeah. No. But did you not hear it? He left no. it on the answer list. It was brilliant. We'll see if we can get it by the end of the night. Oh, that would make my day. It is absolutely hilarious. Okay, well, um, the idea of this is we have covered up um, Puffin's hand and you have to try and work out what it is. Now, you're going to work this out by using the betting, betting patterns. You're going to watch what people are doing um, to what cards are on the flop, and you need to work um, puff it, what, out what Puffin's got in his hand. Now, the reason for this is because reading your opponent's play is a huge, huge, huge part of the game. And now, it's difficult because they're all in, so we're not really seeing any action, are we? So it's difficult to work out what we could have. Yeah. It's basically... Oh, there you go. Tell them about the... Uh... Um, if you do want to have a guess at it, do put the word hole and then your answer, and then your name to 62211. And uh, each month, we're going to look at the most consistent winners, and uh, each month there will be a prize to be given out. The order of the whole is what you'll win. And we will try and get the theme tune that Tragic Trev sung for us, because it was hilarious. And we're going to head over and have a quick look at our multi-table tournament. Lines now up to 25.50. A thirtieth of the original stack and getting bigger all the time. And we've got a bit of a four way pot shaping up here. Wow, look at those hands. They're all in and out of each other. And there's the ace, which is good for Jalm Gray, Mr. Man, there because he hasn't caught a jack, which would cause him problems because he's out kicked by genetically modified organism 13 there. <laughs> well, we started with 244 people involved in this tournament. So it is just one tournament. It's got 244 people in it. Um, we've, only, we've got 188 left. So um, 44, 54, 56 players have been knocked out. There you go. It's, uh, it's a process of attrition. We can't cry for the Michelle. We can't. We haven't got time to For there to be winners, there has to be losers. Now, first place, it's top 20 <laughs> places paid, and first place is $732, so it's well worth winning for the $10 that it's cost you to play. Worth concentrating on? That pair of cowboys here for his Elsa cat. Can't see his or her name. And there's a significant raise, and I think not a bad one. To be honest, not a bad raise at all. And let's see what happens. Wow, now that is a loose call. What is Kaffa? Kaffa on. And he's in terrible shape here because even if he catches, 
He's going to be behind. Well, he can get away from this, but uh, terrible for game fix. Called his king, but no way out of this for game fix. And I can't believe that Elsa Cat is going to let Kaffa Kaffa make the flush. 875 is going to make him pay to draw. Well, Kaffa Kaffa's not getting odds to catch his flush. But he is getting odds if he can persuade Elsa to call him for a bet on the river once the flush is made. And he's unfortunately decided to bluff it instead. And he is out there. Oh, I didn't really understand that bluff at the end. No, I didn't. It looked like a desperation bluff to me. And mm. Elsa Cat played it very nicely. Very nicely. Ace King now for Malona. So bear in mind this is exactly the same game as the cash game we were just watching. Um, techniques do vary depending on what structure you're playing, aren't they? Whether you're in a tournament or whether you're in a cash game or whether you're in a multi-table tournament. Mm. Yeah, you're short-stacked most of the time in a multi-table tournament. And certainly as this goes on, the players will, the average stack will be increasingly short-stacked. Well, the, actually, at the moment, just on that point, the, the biggest stack at the moment is 6,820 and the smallest is 160. Yeah, so, for example, 6,000 with blinds of 50 is is a pretty standard sort of stack to be playing in a cash game, 100 big blinds mm -hmm. or so. And if that's the biggest stack, then uh, it just shows us that the average is, is quite small already. So in multi-table tourneys, and indeed in sit and goes, the question you're asking yourself is, is this t the time to make a move? In a cash game, if you're a good player, although we don't recommend it, if you're a good player, you can you can really make all sorts of different moves before the flop and make them all winners afterwards. Look like what the flop's going to bring you. But in a multi-table tourney, just to, to enter a pot before the flop can take out maybe 10% of your chips, and uh, then you're always going to be struggling to, to get that back if, in fact, you were going in with cards that you didn't really warrant playing. So multi-table tourneys, the question you ask yourself is, should I move now or should I wait? Hmm, it's a difficult one. Um, in multi-table tournaments, it's very advantageous to get a big stack early on, isn't it? But is it worth the big risks? Uh, well, this is a big question that gets, gets discussed a lot, Michelle. Mm. I'm a bit of a poker heretic because it's my opinion that until you get quite close to the bubble, the bit where uh, you're one place off the money, then it really doesn't matter where you acquire your big stack. I, I think it's perfectly reasonable to just pooch along with an average stack size all the way through if you're not getting cards that give you a legitimate reason to go for that big stack and then try and acquire it later. Um, if you get the cards early on, by all means, play them for all they're worth. By all means, play, play a big hand uh, and risk going all out, going out of the competition with it, you know, to get a big stack. But uh, I don't subscribe to the view that a big stack early on makes a big difference unless your opponents are prepared to let it make a big difference. And uh, if they're also trying to acquire a big stack, then there's limited bullying options that the big stack has acquired. So I don't agree, but other players I know do disagree with me. What about big hands and um, pre-flop? Things like aces, kings and queens. Maybe not so much que queens, but aces and kings. Um, pre-flop, mm -hmm. in, a, in a tournament, usually you would say, you don't need to get involved in the first stages of a tournament and with any hand for your whole sack um, because there's still so much play. Mm -hmm. You've still got so many hands to come. Um, if someone's gone all in, um, you don't need to get involved with a lot of hands. Now, obviously, at the beginning stage of the tournament, if you're sitting there with aces and someone goes all in, you're going to call, aren't you? Mm -hmm. um, but some people do subscribe to the fact that you shouldn't because there's still so much more to play and you could get pushed out. I mean, what are your feelings here? If you know that you're, you're a much better player than the rest of the field uh, and you sit down and it goes completely ballistic on the first hand and you're sitting there with kings, throw them away. It may be that someone's got 9-10 suited and the other's got a pair of jacks and uh, you throw away a chance to treble through. But you don't know anything about these players yet, uh, so you should give them um, credit for having aces until you know that they are maniacs. You will acquire information over the course of a tournament and that information, if you're a good player, will help you acquire chips. So by all means, let those big hands go. As Michel says, aces is aces. You can't be behind before the flop, so you play those for all your stack. I think uh, I, I really can't see a better way to play than that if someone decides to put all their chips in against you. But um, I think it's a funny one, that. Again, there's no reason why you shouldn't be prepared to risk all your chips early on if you have sound reason to think you have a big edge going into the pot. 
Um, and if you know these players, say for example you're sitting down at a table where you know four or five of the players, it doesn't matter that it's the start of the tournament, if you genuinely believe you've got a hand here that's ahead, significantly ahead, by all means stick those chips in because you've got to acquire the chips at some point. Thanks Doc. Well we've got um, a text here from William who says, while my game is improving, I'm struggling to put players on hands. How do I try to work out what they might have? Um, it's a really good question, and it's a huge part of the game to be able to do this, isn't it? Yeah, it's absolutely huge. I mean, this is, this is when poker starts. Until you start doing this, poker is, is just constantly going to be surprises to you. You've got no idea what the guy's going to turn over. And basically, all you can do is play the strength of your hand. So what do you do? The first thing to do is to assume... I'm assuming, William, that you're a relatively sound player. I mean, you've emailed us here on Poker Night Live. You've obviously got interest in playing poker well. Assume that your opponent plays poker a bit like you and a bit like everyone else who plays basic, sensible textbook poker. And then say, well, if I had put in that bet, that's when you see this guy's bet, what sort of hands would I not do that with? And then you rule out those hands. Provisionally, you might get more information when the third card comes. Turn card. Did I say third card? <laughs> you did, but we'll move on. Uh, we're, past the, uh, we're past the orchard, so it's fine. I haven't heard that. Well, no, because we go out tomorrow afternoon. Oh, well, they'll, they'll cut it out. It's amazing. When that <laughs> turn card comes, then uh, that may change everything. But provisionally, assume if they put in a bet that would be an odd thing to do, in your opinion, with a certain range of hands, then rule out those hands. Of course, players are going to differ from you. So you make mental notes about how they differ. Do, for example, are they happy to play ace-10, whereas you're only happy to play ace-queen, ace-king? Make a mental note there. So you're always judging them by the sense or the degree to which they differ from what you do. But you, you are the basic um, point from which you judge other players. And just go from there. Spread your wings and fly. But we will, be, uh, we will be looking at that tonight. We'll be having a look at how you can work out what people are doing and why. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is how, what can help you read your opponents. Um, let's do that by going to a cash game. 25.50 cents. It is a hard part of the game sometimes because also, especially when you first start out, you, you forget to take notice of what other people are doing. I mean, even now, um, I'll be sitting here with you, we'll be watching a game for 10, 15 minutes, we can even see everybody's cards, and you'll suddenly say, well, we know so-and-so to be a very tight player, we know so-and-so is quite loose. Somebody else, we've only been watching for 20 minutes, and you would have picked that up on that information, whereas I haven't. Mm. Um, so it definitely um, comes with time. I'm much better at it now than I, I used to be, much, much better. I do make a lot of notes in the note boxes now about my opponents. Sometimes I'll, I'll notice, so even in, in a live game, in fact, quite often in a, a live game, that someone has actually changed, <laughs> the seat occupant has changed, and I haven't noticed. Mm. If I've been playing for a very long time, maybe six or seven hours. And uh, if I haven't noticed this, and I've not seen them do anything, I just assume that they're a tight player. Because if you don't notice someone, Mm. That, that much you know. They're tight. They're not doing things to grab your attention. Two pair here for Cosgrove. And also, a lot of the time, you don't get to see that person's hand, so you don't know whether they were being, whether they were bluffing, whether they had the hand. So you would have to take notice when you do get to see a showdown. That's right. When you're... Um, oh, I should see what happens with these aces. I think actually he's not going to get any uh, action here. When you're playing a live game... How does it work in a showdown? If you've, if you've called somebody's bet on the river, mm -hmm. um, who shows their cards first? Because you're paying to see them, so surely they see it first. Yeah, it's the one who is called. And if you know you haven't beat them, can you muck your cards? You can, you can. Okay. But they may ask, they may ask to see your hand. And if they do ask to see a hand, you, you, you have yeah, to show Yeah, the dealer will flip it over. But it's, you shouldn't, you shouldn't uh, abuse this privilege because it slows the game down and it will, it will uh, cause retaliation. But the rules do say if, if you um, see somebody and they turn it over and you muck, but then they ask to see your cards, you have to show them. Yeah. And um, what about if it's checked on the river? Check, check is also a showdown. Just both for check yeah. cards. OK. That's a very interesting point, actually, because I was arguing with my dad about that the other day. I was right. I'm very pleased about it. So here we are at a cash game, 25.50 cent. Let's have a look who we've got. We've got Blocks, Daz, Blonde Babe, Mialo, Swan Lee, Snap It, M Cosgrove, 
and G4RBO at the top. 244 comes down the flop. So at the moment, we, there's nothing going on. Now, 2345, there is nothing down straight from the yellow. And 2456, there's a gut shot straight for blonde here because he needs the three. Um, so just an example there of being able to look at what people need and what people, what you, which looking at that flop without seeing their hand, you should be able to work out that somebody could be drawing to a straight on the, on the turn there. Mm -hmm. Or even on the, on the flop, somebody could have a, a three and a five, say. And the four spades, of course, very, very much in everyone's view. And the pair as well, the fours, in fact, the board is paired now, means that a full house is possible. Yeah, you have to be wary of a paired board, don't you? Because it means one, somebody could have a set, and it means two, somebody could have a full house, two, two very big hands. Yep, once the board is paired, you're flush, it cannot be the nuts. So don't feel like you're completely safe. And of course, when you're working out what people could have, for instance, on that last hand, um, if you thought somebody was drawing to a straight, um, that you'd have to put them on something like a three and a five. Now, how many people are going to pay to see a flop with a three and a five? Not many. Indeed. And uh, just with reference to William's earlier email, that's exactly the sort of thinking that you, you should be going through. And if they're on the big blind, it's quite conceivable they've got a, a three and a five. But yep. if they've had to pay the big blind to, to see the flop, most people will not do that with the three and the five. And if they do, that's, that's not a very good play, is it? Does so it you, you'll see people in the big blind bluffing when the flop comes down with three low cards because people think, oh, well, they could well have low cards. Mm. And that's another benefit of the pre-flop flop raise. If you're the raiser, when the flop comes down, it's going to give you more of an idea of what someone's got, isn't it? Indeed, yeah, that's one thing I didn't mention, but you're quite right, Michelle. If you raise before the flop, then you can narrow the range of hands your opponent have, your opponents have, and therefore read what they have or what they might be drawing to on the flop. And any sort of way you can reduce the uncertainty in poker is money in the bank. If you've made a good raise pre-flop, um, they're probably going to have high cards or a pair. Depending on the player, of course. Mm -hmm. They're Mark Bannon, they might have a 7 8 offsuit. They might do. I think he, he probably plays other hands as well that he's not telling us about. Mm. So Blox has just limped in here. He's just called before the flop. And he's been punished by Swan Lee, who says, I'll have that 50 cents. And also the blinds, please. Ace 10, you're going to nick and snap it. I think we might see a re-raise here. Yeah, there it is. It's a nice re-raise because it clarifies the situation. I think Ace 10 should normally have folded there. And snap it in danger because he may wrongly put Swan Lee on a pocket pair. Swan Lee not going to push him off it though. And now what? Yeah, questions are bound for Snapper, and he's still worried. Looks like he's now trying to get it to a showdown with check, check. Yeah, he doesn't bet on the end. Quite right not to bet there. Swanley missed a trick there. He could have pushed Snap it off it. And it's a bit funny to call the ace 10 there and then not make a move. Because uh, with a pocket pair, Snap it surely would have bet the flop or the turn. So I think Swan Lee had the information there to, uh, to tell him he wasn't up against a pocket pair and very possibly up against ace, king, ace, queen. Now, Emma Cosgrove here has hit top pair queen, so he's quite happy to call that $2 bet. Um, do you think the call is fine there, or would you have gone for a re-raise of top pair? Depends on your opponent. Uh, I think I'd have, I'd have re-raised there, because I think if the guy then re-re-raises -ra -re me, I know I'm beat. So I find out where I am, because I don't think he can re-re-raise re me with the Queen Jack. But if he, yeah, it gives me more information. I'd probably raise again then. Mm -hmm. well, talking about that re-raise, um, it's, a, it's a ballsy bluff when you do it, if you're bluffing. Yep. I've seen it done. I've had it done to me when I've put in a raise, and somebody's re-raised me, and then showed me their cards and they have nothing. Naughty. And I've wanted to punch them. Naughty, naughty. <laughs> And whereas I, I That's the great thing about live games, you can actually punch them. You can them. actually punch them. But, um, you know, I, I've never done it myself. It seems like so many chips to risk. 
when you don't actually have anything, and they could easily have a hand. I mean, I know it depends what you put them on and what you've seen them do before, um, but it is a very ballsy move. You've really got to know your opponent inside out. Mm. I think it's easier to do it in a live game where people play a bit tighter. Seven, eight seated. Blonde babe has not seen the light. Let's it go. Um, so in this cash game, uh, the amount you see in front of everybody is the actual amount they're playing with. So rather than doing it with chips, um, they're doing it with the dollars they have. So Block there has thirty-two dollars and five cents. Big hand here, I reckon. Ace queen, ace jack, ace king, queens. There's three aces out. Ten jacks suited. Fancy. Yeah, we're going to see a big multi-way pot here. I wonder what Ace Jack off will do. I fold this without even thinking twice. He, he also does so. And uh, look at that. There's a, now the kings for Grebo, I call him. And you folded the Ace Jack because you're not in position. Just because with four people coming in there, I, I think I've got the worst Ace. Mhm. Mm because there was a raise. Yeah. <laughs> It's a slightly disappointing flop for us because it, it connects nicely for Grebo, but for no one else, so they're oh, yeah. going to fold. There's no hearts. There's not, she's got one over pair and a and an up and, and a gut shot there. Not enough really to call. So it all fizzled out there. That explosive situation. Queen's got away from it very easily. Yeah, very well done as well. A lot of people wouldn't be able to, would they? Now the aces versus jacks. Now it's all going to kick off. I think Snap it's going to do twenty-eight dollars here, very possibly. Although he's a fairly cautious player. Depends what he thinks about blocks. Blocks has been in quite a few pots recently. Well, I think we'll see. A oh no, just a call. And now he has to be right worried about the king, surely. Yeah, he's got second pair there with the jacks. And I wonder if blocks will flat call a raise here, a bet from Snap It. Or if he'll just start looking to take this pot right now. Minimum raise, yeah, nasty when you've got the jack say so you don't want to be pushed off it cheap, but you don't want to put in three, thinking, well, what if he bets at me again on the turn? It's a horrible situation to be in. Snap It pays the three. He's hoping he's not going to see more betting from blocks. And uh, what I'm just hoping here is that Snap is not trying to induce a bluff. We'll see if he calls here. It's because he wants to know if Blocks is bluffing, but he's he lets he got away from it, didn't yeah, he? Yeah, gives Blocks the benefit of the doubt. Well played. Not quite as exciting this time round. Oh, I don't know. Two players have made middle pair. Little pair. Okay, now if you're if you're sitting there with, I guess it's we need to create a situation here. You're sitting there with jacks, and uh, you're in early position, mm -hmm. and you've got uh, one or two people behind you, mm -hmm. and the flop comes down, and there's a king, mm -hmm. two low cards and a king. Now your play there. Are you now worried about that king enough just to check and then maybe decide to call to call a bet if it comes along, or? Is it fair enough to, to make the bet yourself? And then if you get re-raised, you know you're beat. Um, but then again, if you get called, you're not quite sure where you are. You could be beat, but you might not because it was just a call. Have a look at the flop. I mean, if there's no, if there's no draws there, and your image is a relatively tight, sensible one, and you're in early position, and you bet, and there's a king on the board, and you're raised, given that you could well have the king, I think you can take that raise very seriously, and that's a statement from someone that I've got you beat. Some of the time they'll be, put, be raised bluffing, but rarely, if your image is relatively tight. So, and I think you get a lot more information by betting there and finding out what happens than by checking and then calling. Because mm -hmm. maybe he sees your check and another player's check as a as license for him to bluff. He bets, you, you call. Now on the turn, if you check and he bets again, he still could be bluffing. You don't know where you are. Mm. So I think you lead out there. Mm -hmm. If there's a king and a queen on the board or a king and an ace, to be honest, I'm quite happy just to let the pot go mm -hmm. and not waste the money spending on finding out that I'm beat when I think I probably am. 
And it's going to cost you the same. It's, even if you make that bet and you get re-raised and you can put it down, or mm -hmm. even if they call you and then bet the next go, you can put it down. It's going to cost you the same if they bet and then you call anyway, whereas if you bet, you're the aggressor, and you could easily take the pot there and there. That's right, and that's, that's a very good point. It costs you the same to check and call than to bet and then either face a call or be raised and know you're behind and fold it. And that's what many beginning passive players don't understand, that they're actually putting as much money in the pot by checking and calling as a, a decent aggressive is player is by betting. Um, but you have to make a bet being quite prepared to fold it if, you, if you're re-raised, if you don't have the best hand out there. Yep, that's it. Do lots of raising and a lot of folding, not much calling. Okay, well, six is against ace-queen. Call, and now he's got a third pair. <laughs> Not a good hand. No. So a bet here, Swan Lee can quite happily feed sixes down. Okay, we're going to have to leave that there, because we are going to break shortly. I do have uh, some emails here, see how many we can get through. Uh, text from Anonymous. I think it is good to get caught bluffing early on in poker games because later on the tighter players are more likely to call your good hand expecting you to be bluffing. What are your thoughts? No, I never want to be caught bluffing because each time I get caught bluffing I lose money and uh, if they fold then I win money. If I want to give the image that I'm a bluffer I can show my bluffs so I can get exactly the same uh, advertising value by running a successful bluff and then showing my cards so that's the way I'll do it. Ah, now should you be bluffing? Um, is, 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 is it as an important as people think it is in poker? You must bluff. You must bluff. Mm. People, uh, people who don't know much about poker think it's everything, and they also think that it's got some sort of mystical, magical reason for working. Bluffs are technical, like any play in poker, and you need to learn the right pot odds and the right situations in which to bluff. But if you never bluff, no one's, no one's ever, no one's ever going to pay you off when you make a big hand because they think you never bluff. They think you've always got it. So you need to be caught bluffing sometimes, or you need to be bluffing sufficiently often, even though they're not calling you, that they can see that you're betting too often for you to have the goods every time. Mm. So basically, by bluffing, you increase the number of times you're betting, and they become suspicious. And if they're suspicious, and you're a good player, they'll call you exactly at the time you want them to when you've got that big hand. Mm, I don't think I do enough bluffing, actually. I mean, I do. I, I, my bluffing seems to be more, it's checked around to me on the flop when I'm in position, so I'll stick in a bet and take it down. Well, anyone can bluff in that situation, <laughs> Michelle. I know. I, I need to start doing it. But I do do sometimes. If I haven't had a hand for a while, I think, oh, all right, and I'll raise it up for the flop and hope to take it down. And then if someone calls me, I'm then going to bet it right up again on the flop and hope that they fold. And if they don't, fair enough, I'm caught. And there's been a couple of times where I've tried it and someone's re-raised me and I've thought, fair enough, you've caught me. I'll put it down. Um, but it's, you know, it's, it's got, a hard thing to do when you first you've start. You've got to know where you are. It's, it comes back to this question of, of reading your opponents. If you know what your opponents have got, it just doesn't matter what you've got because you know that they're going to fold if they've missed. But, um, you know, it does very much depend on, on your, your reading skills. And people who pull off outrageous bluffs, like the Devilfish is a good example. He's someone who stick mm. it, stick it all in with Saturday. nothing. Yes, he was. I'm sorry I missed it. Yeah. And uh, he can put it all in with nothing because he knows you haven't got a good enough hand to call with. And so bluffing, basically, like all aspects of poker, is about working out what your opponent's got. Mm, and, and feeling what you think someone will do. And you do get hunches sometimes. You do get feelings on somebody. Mm. And uh, the, like I said earlier, you know, making notes on somebody is very important, isn't it? As you're playing, you always have usually a little note box that you can um, put something in. Although it is difficult because people do sometimes play differently at yep. different times. Yeah. Don't bluff anyone who calls a lot. That's the most important thing to put in a And a you shouldn't bluff box. them to more than one person, really, should you? Very good point. For a bluff to work, it's got to make everyone fold. Everyone, if one person calls, the game's up. So bluff one person, bluff two, bluffing three, it's getting very difficult then. You're, you're wiser just to let it go. OK, so there you have it. If you do want to bluff, try and make it you and one opponent. And if there's four people in there, the likelihood is somebody has got something. So don't do it. Right, well, we are now going to take some more questions. OK, 
Okay, well, we do have an email here from Hugh, aka Dead Spiders. Quite a long one, so let's read this out. He says, Good evening, guys. A few shows ago, someone sent in a question about poker bankrolls and what happens when you find yourself 1,000 big blinds down. Do you still need another 2,000 big blinds in your bankroll since the chance of taking that big 2,000 big blind knock is the same as it was when you were even? I think it was Cass presenting that night who dubbed it the question he'd dreaded since starting Poker Night Live. I thought about it for a bit and come up with an answer. I think it's an accurate one. When Skolansky and Malmuth, was it, state that in a winning poker player's career, they will experience the losing run equivalent to 2,000 big blinds. They're actually telling us that over the course of a poker player's career, there is a certain probability that a winning player's biggest losing run will be in that region. It's not obvious what level of likelihood was used, but a standard one would be to work to a level where there was a 90 to 95% chance that a poker player's biggest losing swing in their career would not exceed that 2,000 big blind level. This would be known in statistics as a 5 or 10% confidence interval. Of course, we can only work with probabilities here. It's statistically possible, albeit massively unlikely, that a given player of winning ability would never leave a session in profit in his life, or for that matter, that he would never have a losing session in his life. The 2000 big blind safety zone is not guaranteed protection against swings, it just gives you a good likelihood of safety. What does this mean when we find ourselves 1000 big blinds down, half our bankroll gone? Assuming you can continue playing your normal winning game, the probability of losing another 2,000 big blinds from this very point, disregarding the previous 1,000 big blind loss, has to be the same as the probability of losing that 2,000 big blind from a single given point when your whole bankroll is intact. The trick is this. The 2,000 big blind losing swing is calculated as the biggest swing you can take from a level bankroll within the set probabilities, i.e. the 19 to 95% mentioned earlier. If you always cash out your winnings, take it out of your poker life and maintain a 2,000 big roll bankroll, you will be on or around that level bankroll for most of your career. There will be hundreds of thousands of hands or opportunities from which that 2,000 big blind downswing can begin. The probability of Excuse me, the probability of going on such a big losing swing from any one given hand is absolutely minute. It's only because there are so many hands or opportunities for it to happen that the probability of it ever happening becomes big enough for us to protect against it. In contrast, there will be comparatively very few hands played in your poker career when your bankroll is cut in half to 1,000 big blinds. The probability of going on a really big losing swing from any one of these hands is still equally tiny, but there will be far, far fewer opportunities to happen. It's still possible, but very unlikely. What then is the bottom line for a winning poker player who has lost half his bankroll? Although it is possible you could go on to lose another 2,000 big blinds from this point, or at any other time in your career when you find your bankroll in this state, it is very unlikely that you will. Sure, it's possible, but you can't live in fear of risk if you want to be a poker player. Play on. If you do find yourself 1,950 big blinds down, maybe it's time to reconsider. While the probability of going on a massive losing run is still very low, the probability of going on a small 50 big blind losing run is much higher. High enough to be a significant threat, although playing winning poker, you're still favourite to be okay. So in a way, we're still left with a problem. If you do approach the end of that 2,000 big blind bankroll, you find that you need more bankroll to continue playing securely. However, what we need to remember is that the 2,000 limit just gives you a probability that you won't blow your whole bankroll. It's not a guarantee of safety, it's still a possibility to burst it all. If you find yourself with 50 big blinds of your bankroll left, you're facing the sharp end of that possibility. However, for a winning player with his bankroll intact, the likelihood of cutting so close to his bankroll is actually pretty low. If there's a 95% chance of never losing more than that 2,000 big blind, you're probably also not going to get too close to losing it all either. In the terms we used earlier, while the chance of going on the short losing run of 50 big blinds to bust is quite high, the number of hands when you'll be in this position, or perhaps more correctly, the probability that you'll ever get to this position is very low. Thanks very much. Cheers. Um, well, thank you very much. A lot to take in there, but we do appreciate that, Dead Spiders, and we do hope that hoped, helped some people at home.
Welcome back to Poker Night Live, brought by myself, Michelle, and uh, Dr. Tom to my left here. It's a very nice top you've got there, Dr. Tom. Thank you, Michelle. Sorry, that is the impression of me, is it? <laughs> yeah. I'm doing deadpan. It's a, okay. I'm trying to do dry. Uh, no, we've swapped places in case you were worried. Uh, don't adjust your set. Michelle is going to play... A, you're still doing Dr. Tom? Yeah. Is going to play a sit and go, and uh, I will be uh, providing commentary for the remaining hour. Well, she pulls funny faces. We do hope to see more of those. A quick reminder of the what's in the hole competition for tonight. Dr. Tom, what do you think of this what's in the hole? Well, it's a um, fabulous way of uh, learning your hand and uh, what your opponents have. I think it's an aspect of the game that we all need to learn. A very important aspect of the game of poker. Texas Hold'em, no limit. <laughs> I don't giggle like a girl. <laughs> I was doing really well there till you made me laugh. <laughs> Good. Well, I think I come across very come well. Come on then, do me. Um, uh, <laughs> no, I'm not going to do that, Michelle, because I want to keep a good working relationship with you. What do you think puff has got here? I think he's got a, he's got a smaller pocket pair. Yeah, I think he's got... Uh, oh, he might have kings. He should have trip kings or something. We're not actually allowed to give any help, though, are we? Aren't we? I don't know. Are we? I don't know if we are, to be honest. Maybe it's not a pocket pair. I don't know. It could be anything. Who knows? It's luck. Um, yeah, text hole, text hole to six double two double one if you want to enter the whole competition, <laughs> not just a part of it, uh, with what you think. It, don't look at me like that. Please. <laughs> is that what I do? That is what you do. Text hole to uh, six double two double one to tell us what you think Puffarn has made, and you could well be the winner of our What's in the Hole competition. Terrific. Um, now I've got some emails here. Should we do some? Let's. We've got one here from Stephen saying. Uh, who says, hi Tom and Michelle, I'm uh, Garbo from the cash game. You can call me Garbo, not Gribo. Laugh out loud, he says. Just wondered if either of you knew any good poker videos for learning about poker tells. I usually play on the internet, but I also play a few live games with friends from college and stuff and wanted to know more about poker tells and stuff. Thanks for any suggestions. Ooh, good one. Poker videos? I don't know. The classic book on poker tells is... Mike Cairo's Big Book of Tells. You're looking at me in a beseeching way. Devilfish has one. Does he? Yep, DVD. He told us the other day. On videos? Uh, on a video on Tells? Well, it's a DVD. <laughs> right, but it's on Tells. Um, oh, I'm, I'm not sure if it's on Tells, actually. Sorry, I wasn't listening. Well, don't butt in. unless it's, I'm sorry right. about this, uh, Stephen. Um, <laughs> I don't know of any videos on uh, Tells. To be honest, I think you probably spend your money better on uh, something else. But uh, I can't help you. Text again uh, tomorrow and Cass is on because he's read four million books on poker and seen all the DVDs that are out there. So uh, in the meantime, uh, thanks for that, Stephen. Let's take ourselves down now to a $20 sit and go. Not the one Michelle is on, I don't think. But we'll be coming back to that later. No, we should be coming up to this one uh, at about 12 o'clock. So, so you're on your own. You're okay. on your own there at the moment, Doc, I'm afraid. All right. Can you hold the fort? I'll do my best. Look at that, trip nines. Trip nines for Martanic. Gut shot, straight draw for Ghostbuster. And uh, Don Felipe needs a pair of threes to win this. Not very likely. However, stranger things have happened at sea. Not quite sure what, but let's see. Well, he's leading out the betting. And because it's a sit and go... There is no way back if he loses all his chips. No outs now for Don Felipe. And I think he must have now a sense that he's behind. And the pot goes the way of Martinique. As Jarvis, 2 3 suited. Don't think that's a hand I'd steal with. Unless I thought my opponents really were desperate to throw their hands away. Six, he takes it down. So still at level one here. $160 in the pot to be won. 80 to first place. 48 to second, 32. To third. Hmm. 
Danny B leads out. Four times the big blind, standard sort of raise. And he gets called. And that's a big call from Don Felipe there. He's calling with Jack King off suit, which is not a big hand by any stretch of the imagination. It's in grave danger of being dominated, as indeed it is here by the ace jack. Only Felipe's king is good. And when someone in early position raises, well, you've got to put them on a pair or big cards. Sometimes they'll be trying it on with a funny old thing like 7-8. But Jack King is not a calling hand in that situation. Let's see how he plays kings. He's got 740, there's 30 in the pot. Those are the parameters of the problem. He decides to build the pot with a five times the big blind. And takes it down. Could have been worse, could have been better. Ace is now for Jack Alley. And the good news is that Michelle is in a tournament and she's still in. Isak loves your ginger hair, Tom. Uh, I, I'm surprised that he's written <laughs> that. I'm astonished. All the world knows it's strawberry blonde. Oh dear. Danny a long way behind. Up against trip aces. He needs to make a flush or a straight. Or miracle quads to get out of this. And now what? Well, yeah, good fold. Not all that likely. Jack Halley had a club flush draw, and therefore he was almost certainly ahead. Seven A off suit, the mother of all hands. Only if you raise it though, and uh, he's just limped and been raised. Apparently, I'm playing footsie with Hoofy. Really? <laughs> Is that one of your tactics? <laughs> that could be a good tactic, actually, in a live game. I'm playing you um, Wednesday. I might try it on you. OK. I'm open-minded. Uh, I just want to quickly say well done to Gan Jr, because he came 240th out of 12,000 today. Wow. Well done, Gan Jr. Not bad at all. No, that's pretty good going. 10 jack queen, ace king, king nine. 10 jack on this occasion. Paul Novi's got himself all in, and he's, I think, absolutely right to do that. He's almost certainly ahead there. Almost certainly ahead, but he's in grave danger of being outdrawn with those three straightening cards there. Sometimes he'll be up against a better two pair. Sometimes he'll get called by someone with a pair and a straight draw. Something like king queen. But generally, he's going to be ahead, and uh, he's right to bet and push his opponents off the pot. Six do suited. What do you fancy? Not that one. Nick takes it down. And there's a fairly aggressive play there for Martinic. The hands I'm going to put in a steal with, and that certainly is a steal with A7. It doesn't really rate to be the best hand at the table with six players left to act behind him, although it is on this occasion, that's not one that I will be inclined to steal with. I was looking forward to the film. That's my Irish impression for Stephen Mark. <laughs> it's very interactive TV, isn't it? You can get an impression good, isn't it? of seconds. <laughs> what film? 
What do you mean, what film? What film were you looking forward to? I was looking forward to the film. <laughs> Anyone in particular works. <laughs> OK. Three and a half big blinds, pop size raise there from Martanic. And Sjöller, well, is he trapping or does he genuinely think he might be behind? I think he's trapping because we've just seen Martanic put in a bet, but Sjöller has not caught. And I don't mind that call there because if he had caught an ace or a queen, he might well have taken a big pot off Martanic. And he's going to catch one of those two on the flop uh, about a third of the time. Thirty in the pot, fifty now with that flat call from the pair of fours. And three players take the flop. Look at that, Montanic flops all in one go. He flops his straight, checks, hoping for a bet behind him. I think I might have bet that. It's not that safe a flop. A ten or an ace or a jack. Any high card comes, the straight could be badly compromised. He's not worried about the paired boards. And Siola, with king nine there, had it counterfeited by the queen. He started off with kings and nines, he ended up with kings and queens. He got better in absolute terms, but got worse in relative terms because everyone had the queens in their hand. Three times the big blind. The blind's 2040 now. Don Felipe can't really afford to put in too many steals gone wrong. That's his last chance, really. He's being called, and uh, yeah, nasty situation. I don't think there's any shame in letting it go. But likewise, if he thinks his opponent will let him take the pot, that is the time to make a continuation bet. That's exactly what he does. And on this occasion, Siola didn't have enough to call with. So wisely chosen right to bluff there. How are you getting on there, Doc? How are you getting on, Night Nurse? Um, slowly. Mm -hmm. Really getting anything? To be honest. Well, a quick reminder of the uh, text and email numbers for the show. If you want to email us your questions, myself and the Nightmares, about poker or just send us your comments on the wonderful game, there it is six double two double one to Texas Studio four for a pound six double two double one, or you can email us at poker at pokernightlive.co.uk. And there you are, you can have your say on Poker Night Live down the telephone 0906 200 70 80. Calls cost one pound a minute, so get it done in, in the space of a minute if I were you. Lots of interesting poker hands here. Queen King off, 9 10 suited, and a pair of sevens. In some ways, all similar. In uh, where they stand in No Limit, Texas Hold'em. Now comes a flop. Up and down for Ziola. He's all in. Trip sevens. Ziola can still get out of it, but not with a four. And Danny takes out our first casualty. Ziola has gone. King Queen again. Same cards, King Queen off. Seven players remain, blinds 2040. Ghostbusters sitting there with 22 big blinds. He doesn't need to play this hand. He can afford to just flat call it, unlike later in the tournament where it should always be raise or fold. Time to represent the ace. Nope. Ghostbuster is worried that Don Felipe is slow playing an ace. Well, that's an interesting bet because 
it looks like a cheap attempt to buy the pot. Felipe has actually got, got a pair now. So Ghostbuster has fallen behind, and he folds correctly. Although a raise might well have pushed Felipe off it. Fold like the wind. Did anyone fancy having a pop at the big blind there? A7 off? No. Comes in for a call. And it's Miss Miss. Paul Novi, having called there, is in prime position to represent the king. Let's see if he does it. 120 in the pots. 80. Or a pot size bet, why not? 120, that will take it down. Easy money. He's just bet, he hasn't shown his cards, he knows now that it's more likely he'll be called. He just limps. Daz Jarvis probably will just take a flop without augmenting that pot. 140 in the middle, down it comes, and there's the set. Straight away for Paul Novi. Slow played. And there is the house. The set is now bomb proof against the flush and straight draws that the flop provided. The only worry now is a higher full house, and that's fairly unlikely. It gets more likely once the river card arrives. Novi slow playing it to the end. 460 in the pot. If Daz checks, which is quite likely, Paul Novi's got to find a price, a bet that looks like he's bluffing. And I'd probably put in half, half a pot bet here. And one reason why I put in half a pot bet is that's probably what I'd put in if I was bluffing. So even if my opponents uh, watch my play, they still can't tell which I'm doing. Oh, oh dear, well, Daz Jarvis read that badly wrong. And that's a dream situation for Novi. Guy re uh, raise bluffs into him. Battle of the suited aces. Ace 10 still ahead. Takes the pot down. These blinds will be doubling quite soon now. Ghostbuster sitting there with about ten times what's in the pot. And Wax in a big raise there, six times the big blind, just wants to take what's in the pot right now with that problematic hand, Ace Queen. Still with six players left, Ace Queen ain't so bad. However, uh, everything does depend on the propensity of your opponents to play worse aces. If you've been watching them and you find out they don't like playing ace-jack or ace-10, then ace-queen is not really as much stronger as you might hope. But if they've loosened their ace requirements, now that it's down to six players, and you can get action from a worse ace, then ace-queen becomes a kind of honorary ace-king. Felipe, 4-9? No, not tonight. And Ghostbuster the Queen's in danger of not getting any value.
Well, having said that, Don Felipe's come in. 3.20 in the pot. Oh, danger. Felipe might try and take this. Crafty check. Oh, dear. I think he's going to get called. Yeah, Ghostbuster had made up his mind where he was. If he was bet at, he was going to call. And the jack is no good. Well, let's go and have a look at our multi-table tour then. We've got 61 players left. And the big stack is uh, around about 20,000. No sign of him here. Oh, we've got Gilberto there again. He was on last night. Doing great things. Small stack, uh, unfortunately, 635. Not a nice place to be. Two big blinds. Not a nice place for Gilberto either. He's sitting there with best parts of 20 big blinds with an uh, underpair to Massimo. And look at that. He can get away from this, I think. Oh, actually, with uh, 1,000 from Massimo there. Gilberto might take a view. He's got the gut shot, but he's almost certainly behind. He's got every overcard imaginable there on the uh, on the flop, and those pot odds aren't too bad, but they're certainly not good enough to call in that situation. He folds. Blinds one fifty three hundred. Started off at 10.20, how far we've come. Bright, fancy having a pop at it. He's only got about seven, or oh, a bit more than that, uh, about nine big blinds himself. So he had enough chips to have a pop and get away from it. Let's have a look at another multi-table here, multi-table, tawny table. Let's practice that before I come out at night. And there's MD man with 20,000. Chipped up. Pair of queens. Ooh, interesting. Flat calls. <coughs> Controversial. And he's praying now for three undercards on the flop. And there is not three undercards. And now the queen's looking a bit dodgy. And MD bets, yeah, and Bar Yen can't tell the difference between a jack and a king. He might let us go. What do you... Oh, look at that. Decides to have a, a shot at it, and Madman has given up interest. That's an interesting bet there. I think it's only going to get called by a better hand. I think I'd have probably checked there and then decided if my opponent had bet at me whether it was a, a real hand or a bluff. Anyway, he forces his opponent to make the right decision. Let's go back to our second go now. Trip sevens. Do seven off suit. And what a powerhouse it is. Once again, we see it taking the pot down, standing up on the river. Five-handed now. Blinds have doubled again to 40-80. Two more players, and we're in the money. But a fair bit of play left in this tournament. Most players here have got around 20 big blinds. And it is possible here to drift into the money playing very tight. There is now a reasonable chance, well, let's say a small chance, that even if you don't play a hand, that two players will bust out. But that comes with a big caveat. The first one is that if you play like that, then you're going to take third quite often, but almost never first. And in an eight-handed sit-and-go, if you sometimes take third and all the rest of the times bust out, you're going to make a loss, because third only pays slightly more than your buy-in. Secondly, there's no guarantee that uh, two players will bust out. And thirdly, and most importantly, as you drift down towards zero, people are less likely to bust out because they are more inclined to wait and have you bust out before they get involved with each other. So it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. 
by waiting, you ensure that you are the one who, in fact, gets bubbled. However, in tournament poker, all decisions are a question of should I go with this hand now or should I wait for um, the possibility of someone being knocked out in the future and just getting into the money simply by avoiding playing hands, which is uh, something that can only happen in tournament poker, not in cash game poker. There you go, Jack Alley's been getting the luck of the flop. Uh, doesn't matter how good a player you are, no one can make 100% winners on the flop, and Daz Jarvis got the wrong end of the stick. And Martanic in a lot of trouble here, and I think he'll very possibly just give this up. That was a big, strong call from Paul Novi, yeah, and you can see that Martanic is not interested in pushing it through with a continuation bet. He knows that a call that strong might well not fold. And let's see if he feels chastened. A 10-jack offsuit is the sort of hand you might want to bluff with. No, he's not chastened at all. He's shameless. And this, uh, unfortunately, gets a call from Paul Novi. Novi misses a 1,000 in the pot. That's what Martanic has got, more or less. Whoa, he's up and down. But it's on the turn. Jack. Good enough to call. And now, yeah, he's, he's not prepared to uh, bet into Paul Novi again. It, he's going to shy away from playing pots against Paul Novi. I think he's had his, his body smacked twice now. That's a nice way of putting it, Doc. Mm, well, that's how it feels for him. Jack, 10, Queen, King. Up and down for Danny. Bit of a scary flop for everybody, really. Yeah. Certainly is. The one consolation there is that if someone's got a 10, they're probably going to bet it because that is a rather dangerous flop. So, although there's no guarantee, a 10 is less likely than it would be if it was 10, 10, 4, three different cards, say, three different suits. There's the full house. It's all going Novi's way. See, if a bet had gone out previously, Novi probably would have put it down already, wouldn't he? He would have put it down already. No denying it. It uh, takes it away. So blinds now 8160, so serious stuff for Martanic and Jack Kelly. Neither of them can hope to drift into the money now. They know they've got to win chips, and Martanic, frankly, is going to have trouble winning them any other way than getting a double through by taking it to a showdown and showing the best hand. He's pretty much run out of bluffing power here because he just can't put in a big enough raise to force people out. Five left, only top three take a prize. Who will it be? Who have you got your money on in this game, Doc? Well, Novi's a chip leader. He's, he's done everything. I mean, the cards have gone his way. Terrif terrific for him, but he's done things right as well. So uh, yeah, I think he's, he's definitely number one to watch out for. He's in a great situation here to bully the table because when he's got the only big stack, Others may avoid playing him, hoping not to get bubbled, hoping that they'll get into the money. He's been fairly loose before the flop, but he's been dealt good cards. Well, it's going his way again. Ace-10. Oh, he's flat called. Now, that is a curious play. Because Ace-10 off suit there... I mean, he's really effective. He's only got two players behind him he has to worry about because Martanic is, is going to call with all sorts of junk. And, oh, look at that. I mean, he played that like a genius. I don't know how he managed to persuade Ace-8 to, to call. On the face of it, that's a really naff way to play the hand because he's, he's check-called rather than betting with a marginal hand. But as it happened, Danny had a worse ace. I, 
I think, to be honest, that, that looks like good luck to me than good skill. But Novi, if you're listening and you can um, say what I've missed about that play, do let us know why you played it that way. So Martin out looking for an ace. And it doesn't come. It doesn't. She said cheerfully. You got something against Martin? No, not at all. Oh. I have something against aces. <laughs> oh, well, there's a bit of subtext there. <laughs> Uh, oh, so down to four now, bubble situation. Mm-hmm. And Jack Kelly, for him, it's got to be pretty soon. He's got to make his move. And Ghostbuster, unfortunately, is going to put in... He's in a nasty situation here because he knows he's behind, but he's heavily committed. And I think he did the right thing there because there's just a chance he'll creep into the money. Not there. He's now got no bluffing power. King seven. Oh, I suppose you're going to have to, aren't you? You're going to have to. He's got two live cards, which is about the best he can expect for when he gets called. He's still live, but he hasn't caught one yet. Well, he's got the up and down draw now. That's not it. Jack Halley takes him out. It. Don't we all hate the bubble? Casper doesn't even like the words. I like the Does word. he not? No. Bubble. It's very nice. Yep. You've got to deal with it, though. The bubble in a sit-and-go is a lot less severe than the bubble in a multi-table tourney because you've invested so much less time in getting there and getting knocked out. In it goes, and out that goes. Down to three. They're actually um, quite similar, aren't they? I mean, Paul Novi obviously is, uh, is behind the other two. But there's not a huge amount of difference in the stacks. Nope, not now. And now with blinds at 326, shoot, pair of aces. Now, how can they lose? Oh, he's flat called. And if that doesn't look like aces, I don't know what does. And he's made a three way pot. He's looking to take them all out in one go. And he's home and dry. And now he has got a massive chip lead. Ooh, nice one for Paul Novi. Danny, some serious work to do. That one he lets go, and the next one he plays. Oh, lovely for Novi. He takes a walk there. Now there it is. It's going to be ace queen versus six three. No fold for Danny B. Not when he's getting. Uh, I won't even try and calculate the pot odds there. They're very big. Plenty of work to do. Six or a three needed. There's the three. He's ahead. Is he going to stay ahead? Yes. Makes two pair for what it's worth. Well, it's about doubling through at the end. We have seen people come back and win, haven't we? Mm, yeah. He's only about three double throughs away from winning it. Six, a seven, or an eight. But no hearts allowed. And now he's out. Oh, well, he took third. $32 for Danny B. Oh, I don't like that. I like no. a raise there. I'll take a raise every time. Very strange play. Out third. So is this a ten dollar? It's twenty dollar. It's twenty dollar. So one hundred and sixty dollars up for grabs. Eighty dollars to first. And then fifty and thirty. No, that won't be right. Thirty-two forty-eight. Thirty-two forty-eight. Forty-eight for the next player out. Well, he hits his 10. Won't get paid off Jack Ellie. But heads up now. Who will win? You decide. Had to do it. Queen 7. 
Not much here, two, four. Don't think you'll bother, no. Likewise, that can be let go. I don't think an all-in raise, though, is actually terrible. I still prefer a fold, but you can raise with any cards here, really, and it, it can be a, a winning play if you've uh, correctly worked out your opponents in a folding moment at that point. Now, blinds are 640, 12.80. That changes everything. There's 2,000 in the middle. Yeah, and Jack Haley tries it, and he's, he's perfectly justified in making that move because there is a chance that Novi will fold. Not ace-8, though. And now it's curtains for Jack Haley. He's down to 600. Well, well he could come back. You're right. He, he could. could be optimistic here. It's not quite curtains. But he's walking the plank. Ooh. Look at this. It's going to be split or a flush, I think. Currently, they're splitting it, and they remain splitting it. Nines and fours with an ace. Chop, chop. Still got some work to do. All in, he needs to win this one. Yeah, he's, he's dominating. Unless okay. we see a six. Ooh. Ooh. Five, six, seven, eight. No, not quite straight. And yet he's still got a lot of work to do because he's only got a big blind there. Oh, dear. Well, they're live. Ah. Not terribly live now. A couple of sixes needed. Or a six or a seven. No, no miracles. Jack Haley takes second place, $48, $80 to Paul Novi. And, oh, we've got a treat for you now. We've got a treat for you. Here it comes. Mm. I think you know what it's going to be. Oh, it's the oh, chip movement graph. Oh, look at it. Look at, the, look look at, at that. Kissing. Look Isn't at the, it beautiful? Look at the kiss between yellow and green there. So, look at red. Poor old red doomed the dodo at the table. We've got uh, what's in the hole coming up. And do you know what? Earlier we had Trev singing it in text. How did that work? Was it good? Yeah. Was it funky? It was. We'll have to try and get it back. It's brilliant. Oh, I'm sorry, I missed it. Let's have a look at what's in the hole then. What's in the hole? So there's a big raise there, big re-raise from Mac. Puff on comes over the top. I'll tell you, I've got an issue with these what's in the hole things. Why? I reckon they should be picked randomly. Because you, you have to judge you have to judge your um, your answer, not just on the situation, but also on what you think the producers decided is an interesting hand to show. Mm, you're not wrong. Right, you know, you could have aces here. It's incredibly unlikely. Um, but it's the sort of hand you might pick for the what's in the hole. What could it be? Maybe Text a... the word hole, then your answer to six double two double one. This is your job, you're in the anchor seat. Well, I couldn't get a word in edgeways, could I? <laughs> I thought you were supposed to be playing a sitting game. I finished. Have you? It was a wonderful experience. Good. Uh, emails, let's have a look at some emails. We've got one here from Crumble saying, um, oh, Crumble's also called Martin from West Sussex. Mission Doc, he says, I'm enjoying the show as usual. I had to quickly reply to Dead Spider's long email, beautifully read out by Michelle, who on that showing could be the next Natasha Kay. That's you, Michelle, we're talking about. The next Natasha Kay. Lovely. I thought Spider's icon... The next icon... Natasha Kay? Yeah, that's you. Oh. Can you dance? Who's Natasha Kay? They mean Natasha... K K oh, Kaplinski, yeah. Do you know what? I would love to do that. I can dance. We, we could do it together. Forum. <laughs> Who does she Jig. dance with on it normally? Oh, well, well, she had that cute, arrogant young guy. Well, you know, I could work He's on that. He's quite hot, cute. but a bit, you know. I could work on that too. <laughs> um, okay, thanks for that, Crumble. What does he have to say about poker? I thought Spider's argument was well put, but I can't agree with the conclusion. It seems to me that you could use the same argument at roulette. Why you must bet on black after a run of nine consecutive red? Reduction ad absurdum. Reduction ad absurdum. Reduction ad absurdum, as Spider might say, although he'd probably only say it once. I'm more swayed by Mike Cairo's advice, which is to not to treat your bankroll as if it... Oh, dear. Would you like me to do it for you? I'll get there in the end, Michelle. All right, go you on just then. sit there and look like Natasha. I'm more swayed <laughs> by Mike Cairo's advice, which is to not treat your bankroll as if it were a tournament buy-in. When I lose half my bankroll, which at this rate will be by Easter, I'm going to drop down a level or two until I get it back. 
your mileage may vary, as the Americans say. Warm regards, Crumble. Yeah, it's a good point, isn't it? Because by halving your... Uh, Crumble your does tend to make a good point. Does he? Yep. Well, there's a vote of confidence for you from uh, Michelle. Not biased at all. Thanks for that, Crumble. Let's have one more quick one. Who have we got? We've got Chaos. Let's hope it's quick. Hi guys, great show as always, Dr Tom. I was wondering about your opinion on whether poker is vastly greater to do with skill than luck. I believe that at the higher levels, uh, that is the better players, people tend to make their own luck by playing what I consider to be good starting hands and making correct decisions. The luck factor tends to play more of a part when people play hands such as 6-5 or Jack-4, for example, where a flop could create a genuine hand, and this is infrequent in e.g. professional level games. Skillful players will make more in the long run than players who rely on luck. This is very true. Hopefully I've explained this as it sounded in my head, um, but if I have not, then I will email again to correct myself. Enjoy the night. I'm looking forward to more great commentary. Thanks a lot, Chaos. Yeah, luck, skill. There's plenty of luck in the short run. There's uh, only luck when nine players of equal ability sit down with each other, provided that um, one of them doesn't suddenly become better. But in the long run, of course, skill will prevail. That's our motto on Pokemon Skill Life. will prevail. I believe that's true. I think we should find out the Latin for that and have it on the forum in yeah. heraldic devices. Mm -hmm. We're going to take you back now to the multi-table tourney, see how they are getting on. Oh, there it is. There it is. Rich Monk, Elsa Cat, Senora Whippy, Skinner, El Tep, Gallo and Ice Tea at the top. Oh, a Jack Queen for Skinner. King Jack puts it down to the raise. Eight nine decides to come in. Six seven eight nine has the up and down. How much will he pay to see the next card though? Oh, he's going to make the price. Semi bluff. What a pro. Oh look at oh, this. Oh he gets it. Five six seven eight nine. That's what you like to see. Look at them dueling. Unbelievable. He won't get paid though. It just looks too strong. Skinner lets it go. We've got a chip leader at around about 35,000, and the small stack, unfortunately, is on 195 chips. That's a bit woeful, isn't it, when the 600 for the big blinds? Mm -hmm. Is Jack looking about the strongest hand there? Rich Monk with a 9-4, it's going to cost you 600, it's quite a lot. Hello, ace-king suited. He's we certainly got, awarded. he got five big blinds. Awarded? <laughs> Rewarded. <laughs> <laughs> In it goes. In it goes, over the top. Only one way to play that hand now. Stick it in. Yeah, that's right. Have a good think about it. Quite right to do that. And he's quite right to do that because it looks like he's, he's got ace 10 or something, and so he's more likely to get called by ace jack. Or ace 4, maybe. But I like the dwell up. Artep here, a big underdog. Yep. And a good fold. So Rich Monk gets a reprieve, and with uh, nine big blinds there, he's got a bit of space. The blinds aren't going up nearly as fast as they do in a sit go. It's be interesting to see what Senior Whippy does if he's eights. He just uh, flat calls. I think I probably would. If I'm going to play eights I'm, in this stage, I'm probably going to try and take it down there and then. Because mm -hmm. there's going to be over cards to mates on the flop, most probably. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for me, though, everything depends on, on how likely I am to be called. I don't really want to catch a caller or two callers with a pair of eights. So really, you know, if I'm going to have players in the pot with me, I want to get in cheap. But uh, if I think they're likely to fold, then sure, I bet. Oh, Ace King again, this time for Else the Cat.
Well, he's got it all going his way, and the king is no good for Skinner. Skinner is eight. Well, Can I, I just say that I look better in this seat than I do in that seat? Um, you look glorious to me <laughs> in both directions. You usually get the glory of the better seat. Well, um, I need it. Oh, you don't. Thanks, uh, Natasha. Jean. <laughs> Carry on. <laughs> Four King Ace says, uh, Hi, guys. Great show as always and lovely top, Michelle. Oh, thank you very much. It's a, lot, it's, it's a long one. It's nice. It reminds me of the time I spent in Africa, actually. <sighs> I can't think why. Tell me before I come on the show that I look like a zebra. Um, don't cross her. <laughs> uh, I made it to the final table of an online multi-table tourney and after really employing funny. my, thank you, my usual super aggressive strategy, I was second in chips with five players remaining. Wow, the blinds were 900 to 1800 and I had around 35k. Mm -hmm. I was dealt ace-king under the gun. Mm -hmm. I raised three times a big blind and the player in second position with 13k in chips goes all in. The chip leader with over double my stack goes all in as well, and the small blind with hardly any chips calls. After much deliberate, de after thinking for a bit, <laughs> I decide to fold as there was a strong chance that two players will be knocked out and that at least one of the players could have a pair. Would you have folded here? I stand by my decision as, it, as I didn't really want to get eliminated here as I had a good shot at at least finishing second, which I did. P.S. Three players turn over ace-jack, ace-queen and king-queen respectively. And the ace queen wins with his ace high. Oh, it's pronounced deliberation. Yeah, well, it's easy to say like that when you've <laughs> got lots of other words crowding round. Oh, really? <laughs> okay. Well, what would you have done, Michelle? In that situation. Mm. Um, I know when you're listening, you don't have to reread it again. <laughs> well, you're the expert on that. You know, I don't want to rain on okay, your you parade. You pronounce the words, and I'll make the poker judgment. I'd have folded. Uh, yes, absolutely. I think I would have too. You're just agreeing with me, aren't you? <laughs> Only joking, I would have called. <laughs> uh, it's freakish there to find them with those hands which you're beating. Nearly always you're up against at least one pair in there, and very often kings are aces with that kind of showing. So you were right to fold. I, won't, I wouldn't fold there, I don't think, particularly for the equity reason. You're hoping to see people knocked out. I think, um, to be honest, say, if I was up against one player, it's a clear uh, all-in for me. So um, if he was a relatively small stack, as he was. So uh, I think you made the right decision but uh, a freakish matchup. Let's have a look at uh, one more email from Pete. <laughs> great filling there, Doc. <laughs> Thanks, Michelle. <laughs> hey, great show, he says, as always. Thank you. Thank you. It's not always great, though. It's, it's sometimes it's a bit lacklustre. I don't think so. I think it's uh, pretty good most of the time. OK. He says, it's a great show as always, we're not going to disagree. In response to the guy asking about DVDs on Poker Tales, Mike Cairo also has a DVD. I bet he does, as well as his infamous book. It's called Mike Cairo's Pro Poker Tales DVD. I don't actually own it, so I can't really tell you if it's any good. Just thought I'd let you know about its existence. You can buy it from carplayer.com for 50 bucks. Which seems pretty expensive to me. You might be able to find it cheaper elsewhere. Cheers. Mm. You can't spend that on a Poker Tells DVD. Oh, well, not if, if you're serious and it helps. 50 bucks? That is a rip-off. Mike Curry, if you're watching, that is outrageous. That is shameful. That might, it might just be the site. Charging well, more for well, it. Well, someone should be ashamed of themselves. I wouldn't pay 50 bucks to buy that. I don't think his book's much good. Do you not? No, I bought it because I had to in the end, because it's, you know, it's a classic. But I've put off buying it for ages. Have you brought in Theory of Poker yet for me? I haven't. I'll bring it in, Michelle. I feel terrible. You shouldn't really um, expose my meanness on air, but <laughs> you've done it. Uh, no, I wouldn't bother with uh, 50 bucks for Mike Cairo's uh, DVD on Poker Tales, but, uh, you know, if you must, you must. I think people get fixated on Poker Tales because they're, um, they can't be bothered to learn proper poker theory. You think? I think so, yeah. What do you think? It depends how much live play you actually play, I suppose. Most people play on the internet, so it doesn't affect them. Mmm. Well, we're going to take a break now. Thanks for that, Pete. Uh, see you very soon for Michelle's Sit and Go. OK, well, we do have another email here. This one is from Dan. 
He says, I was wondering your opinion on a matter that's been bugging me for ages. I seem to do quite well in cash games at three six dollar blinds, but I have to be honest and say that I prefer doing well in tournaments as they're played more socially and are much more fun when it gets further down the line and all the rubbish are dumped out early on. My only concern with playing tournaments are that there are so many maniacs that call my and other people's raises with garbage and then they seem to hit a board that really shouldn't have helped them considering the initial raise. For example, I'm in the big blind and the button raises to me. I'm holding ace-queen suited and I'm re-raised only an extra 100 chips. Bearing in mind the levels, levels are still only small. The flop came ace, seven, five, rainbow. And he hits all in. I can only think to myself he's hit trips, but my gut instinct was to call. And I tend to follow that nine times out of ten, as I've heard many a times on the show, that gut instincts are normally good. But not this time. The maniac had 7-5 suited in his hand and therefore hit his two pair and knocked me out. I can take bad beats because I know I've been on the good end of them many times as well as on the bad side, but that's just poker. It's just I tend not to find maniacs in cash games because it's more seriously played, but I do enjoy the tournament buzz. Just wondering if you have any tips for me. The thing that frustrates me most is I'm not entering $5 multi-table tournaments, I'm entering $30. $30 plus, but I still managed to find maniacs and I was just wondering if you have any advice as how to play against them. I do try and identify players' strategies on the table by observing the first hands quite closely, but is there anything else I can be doing or should I be playing even tighter around these sorts of players? I know the email's long, just any advice would be very helpful. Doc? Great, thank you very much, Dan. Um, a few points here. First of all, if you're playing three $6 cash games, then an equivalent tournament, multi-table tournament, is much, much bigger than the one you're playing. Because if you're playing three six, you're probably sitting down with $300 to $600. <coughs> and so if you're sitting in $30 multi-table tourneys, then don't be surprised that you find many more maniacs than you do in your cash games. Because the games are much, much smaller. So two possibilities here. One is, is just move up and play a tournament that's um, the same sort of size as the cash games you're playing. You don't say that you're a particularly worse tournament player than a cash game player, so I assume you're just as good. So just move up. Sit down in uh, the $100 or $200 freeze-outs or even rebuy tournaments that you get normally in the evenings on all the major poker sites, and you'll find that there are many, many fewer maniacs there. <clears throat> you will find, of course, that players are slightly different in tournaments compared to cash games. In particular, the gap concept is more preeminent. That's to say people do tend to uh, fold and raise more than in cash games rather than calling. And so the skills you need for winning the game are slightly different to be a cash game, but I'm sure you're aware of that if you're a tournament player. Um, <clears throat> the other possibility is that you stay where you are uh, in the $30 entry uh, fees and then just play those for profit against the maniacs. Uh, to be honest, I don't mind having maniacs in the game if I'm playing a tournament. It's a different thing if I've travelled in a car for half an hour or an hour to get to a casino, sat down, and then I get knocked out because four people call my raise with aces. On the net, <coughs> excuse me, on the net, once you bust out of a tournament, especially if it's a low stakes one like a $30 tourney, you can immediately go and find another tournament, certainly uh, on a different site and more often than not on the site you're on. So just view tournaments as one long tournament. Doesn't matter if you bust out of one, if you've got your chips in the middle and you had equity, had expectation there, it really doesn't matter that you bust out. You can sit down in another one. And what that means is, surprise, surprise, the maniacs are your friend. Because if they're going to play 7-5 against you, then in the long run, you're going to be a winner. What do you think, Michelle? Makes sense? Um, yes, very good advice as well. Thank you very much, Doc. That's what you're here for. <laughs> um, well, uh, I'll take this uh, moment to remind you of the forum, which we were talking about. Um, very good. If you do want any advice, please do visit it, because the guys on there have really got some good stuff to say. It's www.pokernightlive.co.uk. Um, there it is. And uh, you go on there every now and then as well, don't you, Doc, and give out some advice? I do. I do. I'm an occasional visitor. Not as prolific as Rob Knotts UK and Dr. <laughs> Dean. <laughs> yeah, they're on there a lot, aren't they? Um, so if you'd like to know anything, do head over there. OK, well, we're heading to a break now, so don't go anywhere, and the Doc and I will return to your screens in approximately, I'd say, six minutes. So we'll see you then. Hello. Hola. Guten Tag. 
Willkommen. Prem Konnichiwa. Welcome back to Poker Night Live. Here we are. We're back in our seats, although we did change it very quickly. Amazing what we can do, isn't it? We're very nimble. <laughs> yeah, very much so. Um, right, I think we're going to start off with what's in the hole. Um, so it's a reveal. It's the answer. What could it be? What did you think it was? Well, uh, I don't know. A pair of queens, kings, aces. Something. I can't It'll believe be something we haven't got weird. Trev. It'll be something aces. It's aces, you see? That's ridiculous. Because, I mean, how likely is that? I mean, here we are talking about statistics and odds and things, and, and they choose a, a weird one like that. And you can't, there's nothing really there that tells you he has aces, is there? The only, we, we can't work out from the bets, can we really? No, the only way you work it out is, you know, it's a sort of hand they'd show on what's in the hole. <laughs> I suppose I shouldn't grumble on air, but there you go. Sometimes it happens, aces versus aces. There you go. Uh, when are we going to show the new one? Quite, quite soon, I think. OK, we're going to be doing that... Um, but it'll be aces anyway, soon. don't worry. And we'll be showing a new one, ready for tomorrow. But they have it, aces. What's in the hole? OK, we're going to go straight to my tourney, which is just brilliant, and I can't wait for it to be shown. It's a bit of a brutal really way to get, to get done with aces, isn't it? Done by a flush. Great, mm -hmm. so your tourney. Pardon? Your tourney. Yep, that's where we're going. OK, let's do it. Really, really looking forward to this, because um, it's brilliant. And your chip nurse. Chip nurse. Well, you've got Hoofy on your left. Yes, Hoofy. I was really pleased to be playing with Hoofy, actually. Mm-hmm. Um, so I was quite Ooh. glad he was to my left. Who's this Kev Steele bloke then? Mm, well, we'll keep your eye on him because he's a bit of a player, me thinks. Um, yeah, all in first hand. Everyone was like, whoa, that's a lot to risk for, um, for 30. But then again, if you get called, you know, but you have to be called by something worse, don't you? And the only thing really that's going to call him is, I suppose, kings or aces, and then he might be in trouble. Yeah, it doesn't make much sense, that move. I think he just wants to make sure he's got 30 more chips than you at the start <laughs> yeah. so that he can take you out. <laughs> hmm. Hmm. <clears throat> well, I've got king eight, and I'm thinking, hmm. Yeah, what are you thinking there? Because some people will call that. Yeah, I nearly did, you know. I thought, you know, let me put it down. I thought, no, I'm not going to. I'm not going to just do it for the hell of it. I'm going to play how I would usually play at home. Mm -hmm. um, which I'm contradicting myself because at home I would stick in the ten. <laughs> ah. <laughs> and for some reason I didn't. Maybe, maybe it's because you know I was. I think to be honest, I was typing and uh, mucking about at that point, so I, I just folded. Which is really bad advice, and you shouldn't be mucking about and texting and typing and laughing with you. you should, I should be concentrating on the game. Well, sometimes it helps. Look, there you flop top pair and real bender. Um, I don't. Sure, he won't mind me yeah, I could have that. lost money, you see, so it's a good job I didn't. Thanks, trip tens. So you've got the button there, Michelle. How do you feel about that? Um, with 5-8, I'm quite happy not, not to even worry about it and put it down. Um, quick shout-out to everyone in the game. We've got Hoofy there, of course. Redford. Um, CR. I think that's pronounced like that. Kev Steele. And I, it really weirds me out every time I see Kev Steele, because he's a very close American friend of mine, who's actually an Apache helicopter pilot. This Kev Steele? Um, no, it's not him. Oh. Um, it's obviously it's a different Kev Steele, um, but he's a very dear friend of mine, so it's really weird to see Kev Steele down there. Uh, anyway, we've got Buffy Be Good, Real Bender, and X Bud X at the top there. OK, now I've got King Queen. So I'm thinking if it's limp round to me, I'm going to put in a raise. But Kev raised it anyway, so I think, OK, I'm going to call the raise. Mm -hmm. Uh, my hand's not good enough to re-raise at this point. Um, I think he's probably got a hand. I do put him on a hand because of that wild move he made before. I think if he didn't have so much, I think it would be a lot more than 60. So I actually put him on a hand here. And then I see the ace, and I put him on an ace. And that was a really difficult decision for me. And I did put in the chat box, you didn't give me odds, Kev. Um, because if he'd given me odds, I would have called for the flush. Um, but he didn't. He well, made it too expensive. Oh, Abby, you've got the gut shot working for you there. Got the jack working for you there, Michelle. So does that make it? Twelve outs. I, I, I'm going to call. Do you know what? I hadn't even noticed. I had the, uh, the gut, gut shot. shot. I didn't even notice that. No, didn't come into the equation. I might even call against Kev Steele just with the flush because he's. We've seen he can stick it all in. Yeah, it, it, I was trying to do it, making the right decisions though. Sure. And because he didn't give me odds, I thought I'm not going to play it because sure. that, that would be the wrong thing to do. And because I did put him on a hand because he didn't make a re really huge raise, I thought, I think he's got the ace. Fine. Um, so I'll, I'll play the odds here. 
But I nearly did. I, I had to think about that while it did take me a while to decide to fold it. I was looking over your shoulder, actually, when you were playing it. And then oh, I, were you? And then I thought, oh, I've gone quiet, and uh, Kev Steele will work out that you've got a hand that's interesting, because my commentary's gone quiet, so I went straight back to the ah, game. Ah, yeah, see, that's very interesting, because a few times I nearly wanted to do some wordplay, um, which is allowed, isn't it, surely? If I want to muck about and tell them what I've got and lie about it, just mm -hmm. like I did with you and the Kings, surely, you know, I'm allowed to do that. Or we're not, I don't know. Is it abusing my position? No, well, I mean... Because if you're in a live table, you could. The, the rules are changing. For a long time in Britain, you weren't allowed to make any sorts of verbal comments about your hand, speech play it's called, but now, now those rules are being relaxed. Places like the Gut Shot Club, um, things like the, what, the European Poker Tour. So I think pretty soon it's going to be like America. You can say what you like. Mm -hmm. Well, I've got Queen 4. Happy to put it down. It'll be interesting to see what you're able to do. Yeah, you know, I was really looking forward to getting into a bit of tumble with Hoofy, you know. He doesn't tumble, not to the bubble. I know, which is why I think, you know, I hope I have a hand against Heath, that would be interesting. Jack seven, quite happy to get rid of it. Ace queen minimum raise. And because usually you advocate three or four times the. That's the probably the here. place to start from. You can put in mins, fine. Or I generally don't raise. I almost never raise more than four times the big blind unless there really are nutters out there. Well, the threes. I mean, he's bet out there. He's now been told that obviously he's beaten. Um, but yeah, I suppose it's fair enough to bet out to see if you can take it. You mm -hmm. know, something I probably would do. Mother of all hands. Seven eight. I had to play it. I thought I'm not going to raise it, but I'll limp in. I'm not in position to raise. Um, but I'll give it a limp, see if, uh, see if it works for me. But unfortunately, Kev's got the king, so I don't get to play it. <laughs> Some might say that's a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see what he does with them. So he's not really too badly, is it? He's king, he's had kings. He had another hand early on. I can't remember what it was. I'm pretty sure the fives aren't going to boogie here. Nope. Not good enough. Queens or Jacks, maybe, against him. All right, we'll raise two on the big blind. Um, now, I won't play this to a raise. Um, funnily enough, I've got the same as a small blind. If everybody had, lim if everybody had folded, I may have um, raised it just to steal the small blind off him. But it's a difficult one, that, isn't it? You shouldn't really raise to steal the small blind, is it? It's not really worth it, I suppose, if you don't have much of a hand. I, I do reasonably often. If I'm, I'm just certain that if he had a hand he would have raised, I take a call as a sign that he can be pushed off it. Mm -hmm. And I'll do it with, with a range of hands. Well, it was checking and I thought... Oh. Doesn't like anyone's got anything. I can go for a steal here. I can put in a bet. And just so I was thinking that X bud did, and I thought, oh, I'll let him have it. I don't want to get jiggy with it with nothing. Get jiggy with it. Boogie on down. Got that in my head every night at the moment. <laughs> Is it Trev's What's in the Whole Rat? <laughs> it, it was very good. It's a shame we haven't heard it. I mean, for the sake of 20, some people would pay that hoping to catch an ace. But. I'd rather just not get involved, because you can get caught out so many times. You can cause yourself to have to face difficult decisions later on. Real bender takes it. OK, I've got the ace four on the small blind. Uh, at home, I would probably, if no one raises, I'd put in ten here to try and hit two pair or something. Um, I can't remember what I did here. I think I did. Because it's, it's so cheap in relative to what your stack is, you may as well to try and catch something, you know, two pair or maybe two fours will come out. You've got a great kicker. You, if no one raises, I think it's worth it. A lot of the time, it is right to put the small blind down, isn't it, and not get involved? Because you're obviously you're in a terrible position as mm -hmm. well. No way out for you here, Michelle. Neither the ace nor the four are going to put you in the lead. No. Nope. A couple of diamonds is what you need. That would be nice. Got a feeling you're not going to get a chance to draw to them. CR there, thinking about betting up his twos. I 
Um, I just text, which is fair enough. I wouldn't be getting involved with a pair of twos, I don't think. You? Do you even play with things like twos and threes, Tom? Do you limp in or...? Twos and threes right at the bottom. Oh, look, there's your diamonds, but trips for CR. Uh, they're, I nearly always play them for implied odds and nothing else if I'm playing with really, really small pairs. Until late in the tournament where, sure, if I've only got four big blinds and there's any chance that the big blind will fold and I'm in late position, I'll, I'll move with them. I didn't, uh, I wasn't getting odds again there, so I folded. Nope. That's absolutely right. Four to one. It's just unfortunate for Real Bender, isn't it? Because he's got the two pair, but the, flat, the threes out there might help him. The fact that there's a three, uh, three diamonds out there might help him not. Oh, see, I just checked it. Obviously, hoping for a, him to bet into him there. Yeah. King Queen again for me. I'm trying to remember what I did. Oh, looks like you're coming in. Um, yeah, I think I raised it. I think I thought, right, I'm going to try and take this pot down. I haven't done anything for a while. Um, so I did three times the bet, 40. Um, and I really, truly thought that would push everybody off um, because I hadn't played for so long. And I'm already perceived as a tight player anyway in these uh, tables. Um, and I was thinking, and Kev kept telling me, what have you got, what have you got? And he came in with me and it was really difficult to know what to put him on again because he's had some really good hands. And I think he bets on me here and I put it down. Well, I nearly went for the re-raise. I really don't know what to do here, actually, to be honest, Tom, so I'd be interested to get your input. If he bets, I, I think I do put it down. I'm, I'm worried about and the Because he bet quite a lot as well. And I remember sitting there and I really didn't know what to do. I fancied the re-raise, but I thought even if I re-raise, I have a feeling he could even then re-re-raise me, because he's a bit of a mover. So I put it down. Mm. Well, you got away uh, fairly lightly when you're dominated, so lots of worse things could have happened. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's good then. You, because cause I bet pre-flop, if he had checked, I could have bet and probably taken it. Um, but it's quite aggressive, Kev. OK, so here, I've got the aces. Kev's on the big blind. I'm thinking this couldn't be any better. Because if I slow blind, I said, if I made a, make a raise, Kev's going to think I'm trying to go for his blind, he's going to re-raise me, which is perfect. I don't need to slow play it, because even if I bet it, he's either going to call or re-raise, because he won't let me have his big blind. Mm -hmm. um, and he did. I can't remember who raised me or just calls. And um, he just calls. Perfect. And uh, I think he's going to bet out here, and uh, I'm going to come over the top. Uh, with my aces, because I'm not flying by that flop at all. I don't put them on uh, two diamonds. Um, so I'm thinking, brilliant. So I, so I don't want to go all in. I don't want to push him away. I reckon I can have, I reckon I can double up here because mm -hmm. of the type of Kev, player Kev is. I think, right, I'm just going to re-raise him and then he will come over the top and we'll be all, you know, but I'll think about it and try and make him think that I haven't got anything. So I waited a while, tended I was thinking about it, put in a bet and then he did come over the top and I called. Um, so I'm thinking, brilliant, you know, I knew I'd, we'd be in for all our chips. Perfect. He's got a jack. Oh, look at that. Queen comes on the river. Two pair and I go out eight with aces. Damn it. Couldn't believe it. Tom, what's going on? Well, the more high ground's yours. Yours, Michelle, you know, you had the aces. What's going on? Hey? You got him in there. You let him catch his jack. But I mean, I mean, was my thing? I've told you exactly there my process of thinking, and was that correct, or should I have pushed in earlier, or did I want him to come all in with me? Did I make that mistake? No, I think you, you played it right. I mean, to be honest, I think when you when you put in your minimum re-raise, by then, if I'm Kev still, I don't reckon you're going to put your hand down because mm. you've committed so much to the pot. So there's not really any difference between your minimum re-raise and, going all, and going all in. But, I mean, basically, I think you've, you've played it fine. I mean, it helps you that he catches his jack. It helps you that he raises in the first place. But, of course, you know, if you're going to go for the double through, which you did, uh, sometimes you're going to get them busted. Mm -hmm. And you can be perfectly right to go for the double through because in the long run you'll make more money that way, but yeah. sometimes they're going to be busted. I mean, I definitely didn't put... I knew he didn't have... 
at the time he re-raised, I knew he didn't have the hand, or I really strongly thought he didn't have the hand. No. Um, from watching his play before, I thought he was trying to come over the top of me. Um, so it was a shame. Two pair. Damn it. Eighth. This is my track record that's in jeopardy here. Well, you went out with aces, you know. Some some commentators go out with three, four suiters, you know. <laughs> was that you? So, uh, I mean, the, the way I like to put it is I had trips and a flush draw, but, you know, it's still three, four. But um, there you go. What can you do on the big blind? <laughs> so I really wanted to play another one, but I wasn't allowed. Oh, really? No. Play on someone else's account. That's what I did. <laughs> yeah, I should have. I tried to go in another one and got told off. No, we do. It was firewalled. Do you know what? I think I've got an email from Kev here. Ah, apologising, I hope. Um, oh, it's quite a long one. OK, he says, we'll freeze that tournament while we read this, because it's from Kev. He says, Michelle and Tom, firstly, can I say sorry to Michelle for being really lucky in the sit and go? I would have usually folded Queen Jack on the big blind, especially knowing how tight Michelle is, but I'd shown a couple of bluffs early on, and one of them was against Michelle, and I heard her tut when I showed it, <laughs> which I think I did. <laughs> uh, so I decided to call and bet only if I hit the flop, hoping, to, hoping she'd think it was another bluff and might try a re-raise bluff. I was expecting a re-raise, whatever she had, and I put her on ace-king or maybe ace-queen. I'm not sure whether it was bad play by me or not, but Michelle definitely did the right thing and got very unlucky. Oh, thanks, Kev. Um, can I also mention multi-table tournaments? I've just heard someone talking about not liking playing against maniacs. I've had the same problem, but it's worth sticking at it and waiting for your luck to change. You can easily go into, say, six all-ins quite early on and be a 70% favourite in them all. But this still means you'll probably lose about two of them and could get knocked out and be very annoyed. But I think you need to keep moving all in against maniacs and soon you will, will win five or six of your all-ins and have a huge stack which should help you do really well in the tournament. Please can you comment on my play in the sit and go? You can be as nasty as you like, I'll just take it as constructive criticism. No, I think he did fine. I mean, once he's played with the jack, uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> once he's gone into the flop and he's caught the jack, then uh, he's got to play it. And uh, I liked his reasoning there that you were... Uh, uh, going to play back at him. I think it's certainly flattering to you, Michelle, that he thinks you're capable of putting in a continuation bluff raise on the uh, flop there, which is, uh, in fact, you had the aces. But if he thought that, mm. that you were going to raise him with any hand, he must think you're a bit of a player. Mm. It's pre-flop, and I do tend to follow on with a better lot on the flop anyway. Well, you could have aces. I could have the aces. What does that mean? <laughs> Thanks for that, Kev. Uh, well, we hope yes, you go on to win it. Yes, thank you for that. Yeah, let's have a look. Let's see how Kev does. Back to the sit and go. Well, look, Hoofy's got them. And let's just on attacks the blinds. Not very promising, the hands there. Let's see how Hoofy plays the aces. <laughs> I hope he has more luck than me. I think he does have a bit more luck than me, actually, and I had a go at him about it in the text. <laughs> You're saying he's luckier than you? That's a terrible thing to say. No. Look, he hits an ace. Damn it. Why can I hit an ace when I've got them? Maybe, hey? we'll, maybe we'll get bluffed off it when a club comes. Oh, hello. Ooh, trip five to faces. That's yeah. very unlucky for Redford. Yeah, Hoofy's got it. Although there are three clubs out there. Might save one of them. Well, Redford. All over. If he doubles through. Well, why couldn't that happen to you? Why couldn't that well, happen to me? Go. Well, it will hey, at some Hoofy point in the took future. All my, all my luck. took your luck. Look, he's a Look, here. Michelle, I can't Come let on. this go by. I mean, we, we go on about, you know, being don't, rational. I'm joking. All right. I know, but some people, you know, don't realise. Go on then. Um, there's a message here from Issa K. He says, hey, Dr. Tom and Michelle, I have a great question. This is what happened to me. I had pocket aces and was one away from the money. A person goes all in and another calls. They are both tight players. I folded because I did not want to take the risk and therefore I made it into the money. What would you have done? Hmm. Probably would have called with aces. You're on the bubble with aces. Yeah, I'm probably going to call. I mean, it depends on the prize structure there, but unless there's um, a massive difference between the bubble and whatever the first position in the money is, and first prize is not massively different from, say, second, then I'm going to play the aces because a lot of money is tied up in the, in the top positions, particularly in first place. And if you put down aces in that situation, then you're passing up the opportunity to get that money. So 
there needs to be a fairly catastrophic difference between no money and some money in the uh, bubble situation and also a fairly flat price structure thereafter. So usually I'm going to call. There you go. Okay, excellent. Okay, for Steele, going his way. He takes down another nice pot and he's a chip leader. I think Kev's going to win it and Hoofy's going to come third. And we actually have an email from Kev as well explaining that first move he did. You know he went all in with the Ace-King oh, yeah. and we thought it was a bit maniac, like a maniac. He said, just to explain my all in with Ace-King first hand, I would only do this first hand as people could well think I'm a maniac and I just want to steal Michelle's blinds with 7-2. <laughs> I've done it about five times before in sit and goes, either with aces, kings or ace, kings, but only on the first hand. I've been called twice, once with jacks, which beat my kings, and once with king jack, which lost to my kings. So I reckon it's worth a try, especially at this level. Very interesting. Mm. Very interesting. The trouble is, though, with your ace, king, is, is when you get called. Because you're not likely to be uh, ahead. Well, because I'm no longer in the game... Yep, you've lost interest in it. <laughs> no, I did carry on watching it, to be fair. Look, they've... Uh, now they've knocked you out, Michelle, they're enjoying themselves and everyone's still in. I know. I wanted to get jiggy with it with Hoofy as well. Did you now? Mm-hmm. I told him when we first started I was gonna... I was gonna get his chips. You're going to tussle with him. <laughs> but no, it wasn't to be. He's at it again, look, Jack A off. <laughs> he certainly is an aggressive player. Redford looking like he might join you. However, he's picked up the hand to defend his big blind with. And the king is totally live. Couldn't be better. And there is the king. Just a gut shot for real bender and a backdoor flush. Or now four. Oh, there is the gut shot. So both of them split it. In it goes. Yep. And those are quite attractive odds. Three to one. So you should, should see our call here? Mm, yeah, no, not really. Nearer the bubble. It's, it's probably uh, going to get a small amount of expectation from that pot. But there's no reason to call. You can call or fold. I don't think it makes that much difference. I, Probably fold. Played hands one. I'm not even in it. <laughs> you were there so briefly. <laughs> I'm such a bad loser. <laughs> I'm terrible. What advice do I have you for, for people like me, Tom, that hate to lose? Because you're one of us, aren't you? Me? You don't like to lose, do you? I don't, no. But I tend to shut up about it eventually. <laughs> do you? Well, we're talking about the kings here. No. OK. Heck, you brought that up, not me. OK, uh, what's my advice for people who hate losing? Mm -hmm. Don't play in the first place. Yeah, what if you like playing? And then become a Taoist monk. Become a monk, that's your advice. Thanks Take for Valium. <laughs> Win all the time. <laughs> I suppose it doesn't matter if you're winning in the long run, which I am at the moment. Maybe we need a drug that alters our perception of time so that the long run seems to come around much quicker. That's what we need, yeah. Queen King for Buffy be good. Ka-ching! 
And is Kev going to make his next move? Oh, could be now. And really, with the stacks behind him, apart from Hoofy, any move is going to commit him to a pot. And Hoofy is a tight player. And I think he's quite right to make that move there. There it is, unsurprisingly, he finds he's not in brilliant shape, but he's slightly ahead. Danger, danger. That's one out gone for X, buddy X. Nine hearts. Kev still takes out a player. So, there goes seventh. You can join me on the loser's bench. On a slag heap of the game. <laughs> Nursing our wounds. But you had aces, Michelle. I know. And I did the right thing, so therefore I am happy. Ah, uh, now Kev has run into it. He must know that Hoofy's got it here. And it's interesting, he's got ace jack there with... With ace queen, he might credibly put Hoofy on ace jack. But I think mm -hmm. with ace jack, yeah, he knows he's beat. And he folds correctly. Okay, we're blinds are now 81.60. We are watching a tournament. It's a tournament I played in earlier. $10 buy-in. Um, to the dust competition. So once you're out, you're out. You do not get your money back. Top three places are, play, uh, places are paid as CR goes all in with the king four. And he's counting on Kev still being a Razor and a folder, but not a caller. And he counts correctly. Who's going to be next? Well, I think Redford has chucked his lot in with A7. Mm -hmm. Got a bit of work to do. Don't think Buffy's going to fold for 20. And just to make things even more difficult, Kev still comes in with two overcards to Redford 7. Hits a queen, but red hits his, uh, queen nine, he's got two pair, look at that. So only a seven or an ace to help Redford. Uh, Kev wanting to get rid of Buffy be good here, or he wants him to come in. He's going to take out two of them, unless Jack comes. Oh, board pairs. Redford's out, but Kev still gets... Uh, oh, Redford takes a split, I beg his pardon. Aces and sixes with a queen, yes. Didn't see that. But Kev Steele's queen nine is counterfeited by the paired board. Nasty. Well, that was a reprieve. I was struggling to see how Redford was going to get out of that. <laughs> Buffy be good, lets it go. He just doesn't want to put his tournament life on the line with ace eight. Unfortunately, he was ahead. Well, maybe it's Hoofy's going to take this. He's probably going to pick up a pot here. Real Bender would be unwise to enter this pot with threes. He knows he can't take it with a bet because Redford's already in. Oh, I don't like it. He's committing himself to playing threes out of position. With little in the way of implied odds, and he calls. Yuck. Calls against Hoofy, of all people. Not a maniac. And Hoofy takes out two players. And wow, look at that chip lead. And that is unusual for Hoofy. Normally he's, uh, he's treading water by this stage of the tournament. Mm. But he's had a couple of situations here, and he's got himself into a big chip lead. Let's see if his strategy is, is different, if he starts to bully now. So what would his strategy usually be? Normally, he plays it very calm and quiet at the start. He's normally, by the time he starts having to nick, he's down to maybe 
600, 750, and then he starts nicking. But he doesn't go mad. He's queen against those king here. We're at the bubble situation now, so people do start to be a bit more careful. Now CR's got in 480. Now I suppose you can still get away from it, um, but you are tempted with an ace queen to then be in for all of it. It's difficult to get away from that, I think. Yeah, yeah, because he might have been raised by his check. He's committed there. Um, so it's CR on the bubble, unfortunately, for him. <clears throat> Left with three players. I think they will uh, play quite well. Yep. Uh, Kev's been very aggressive. Uh, seems to have worked by him, for him. Yep. Uh, Hufi, still ship leader with the Jacks. Aha. Uh -huh. That was lucky. I think Buffy wondered if he was, I wondered there if he was thinking about having a pop at Hufi's <laughs> big blind. Uh, if he makes things simple for himself there, he's denying Kev any chance to raise. Yeah. And that's uh, his logic there is that Kev might raise with any two cards if he thinks there's a chance Hufi will fold. So Hufi says, well, look, you know I'm not going to fold. Don't try and raise me. Still a big raise there. Ace queen now for Hoof. I wonder if Kev have a pop. I think he might go all in here. He's thought a bit too long now. Yeah. Right, he's got him. He's left himself one. <laughs> <laughs> just, just in case he goes out, and then, then he might be able to come back. And if he hasn't tried to bluff him off it, strangely. He's just called. <laughs> This is the sort of behaviour that causes software to crash. <laughs> so Kev Steel has one. Yep. He's an eight nine. He's got a few double ups he needs to do here. <laughs> yeah. It would be hilarious if these if the Buffy and Hoof Hearted had gone against each other and Kev hadn't and managed to scrape in second. Well they wouldn't do that, would they? They'd check it down. Wow, look at that. Makes top straight. No, he has two, three even. So he can come back. He's tripled through. He's <laughs> still only got three. <laughs> and what do they have to do to get this guy to lay down? That's no good. That makes a straight for Kev. He's double through again. <laughs> He's got six. He's going to come back. They're breeding a monster. And you see, he can let this go. This is interesting, Michelle, because having left himself with one, He's in a situation where he can fold here, and there's a chance that one of them will bust out. This is pretty creative play from Kev Steele. Which he does. This is very interesting indeed. The others aren't going to get jiggy, though, are they, knowing that Kev's only got six? You know, they will. If one of them gets, gets kings, one of them gets queens. Yeah, that's true. They're going to play it. I'd love... I'd love to know about how the maths works here, because obviously by, by leaving himself one, he's, uh, he's denied himself an opportunity to get one extra chip when he puts himself all in. He gets and double gets through creamed. again. He's on 12. But I wonder if this is a, a valid sit and go strategy to always leave yourself with one. Well, he's. Um... Oh, the five's come. To end for the steel meister. Ah, well, your nemesis, you don't seem to hold any uh, grudge against? No. No, because... Because um, he emailed you. Well, not only that, I, I... The thing I like about him is you can get chips off him um, in a situation um, <laughs> so you like him for purely mercenary reasons? No, what I mean by that is I quite like it when you can put a title to somebody. I can put him down as, um, I think he can play, um, but he's very aggressive and he will make moves on you. And uh, if you have the hand, so don't play him, don't bluff him, uh, but if you have the hand, you can get the chips off him. 
So in a way, it's nice to be able to know where you stand with him, if you know what I mean, whereas a lot of plays, you don't know where you stand. Um, so I didn't mind that play again, that he did against me. I mean, it was unlucky, obviously, with the aces, but... Uh, um, I actually do like aggressive players as well. It's easy to play aggressive players, I think. You just tighten up. You like your men to be loose and fast? Well... <laughs> it's just always the way it works out. <laughs> what are you trying to say, Doc? Nothing at all. But I'm a great judge of human character. I know, I'm single now. Oh, well, now you've opened the floodgates. <laughs> That's how to get the emails in. <laughs> are you single, Doc? I'm not, Michelle. Are you not? We can't, we can't uh, be a beautiful couple, unfortunately. Oh, you've got to love. I you don't, I don't, love. I feel a bit squeamish about talking this on, about this <laughs> on, on a live show, I must say. <laughs> That's it. There we go. Let's have a no. look at your, what colour are you, Michelle? I don't know. Let's have, this is going to be. It's not going to be that long, is it? This is going to be wonderful. There we are. There we are, I'm red. Hmm, <laughs> plonk. Oh Maybe. dear. Great. It's tragic, isn't it? Because normally we just look at the wonderful colours, but when it's you, <laughs> it, it, it becomes a bit more tragic. <laughs> well, thanks for that, Michelle. That was most entertaining. Did not do anything wrong, did I, to be fair? No, you didn't. Hard luck with the aces. Right. Should we do an email? Right, we're going to do an email, and then we're going to have what's in the hole. Right, we've done that one from Pete, haven't we, Doc? You didn't delete it. Just before you read out an email there, um, yeah. Michelle, for those of you who watch the show who regularly post on the forums, then um, I'm interested in opening up a thread there involving that move by Kev Steele when he left himself one chip. Uh, he decided he was going to go all in, but he left himself one, and he put himself in a situation where just possibly his opponents, and this is around the bubble time, or at least when the prize money was getting bigger, his opponents might, one of them might bust the other out, enabling him to move one place up prize structure at more or less no cost to himself because he's not really thrown away much by saving himself one chip. And I wonder whether that is always going to be a valid thing to do. I've never seen it before but it's really got me thinking. So forum posters, have a think about it and I promise I'll jump into the fray myself when I've had a think myself. Well there you go Mr Steele, you've got the dock thinking. It's a feat on its own. It hasn't happened for weeks. What have we got here? An email from Dave B. Okay. Hello, Dave. He says, Hi there, guys. Loving the show. Learning a lot from you. Thanks very much. Just a story about my untimely exit from multi-table tourney last night. We're well, sitting nicely in fifth place with only 79 people left in a tourney, which started out with 860-odd people in. Just decided to sit out for a while and let the others knock each other out when I'm dealt pocket aces. I obviously couldn't fold them, so I just flat called the big blind, which was then raised and then re-raised by someone else. Only three of us left in the pot. I raised them both to all in, which was about two thirds of my stack. When the cards were turned, I shamed my aces and saw that the other two guys had kings and queens. Queen came on the flop and knocked the pocket kings out and ruined my tawny. I subsequently went all in the next hand with ace eight suited to try to build my stack up again. I was called by aces, which on this occasion stood up and knocked me out. Fifth place to knock down in two hands. Gutted. How could I possibly have got away from that? Surely I played it right. Please help. Do you think maybe you tilted a bit, tried going all in with the ace eight in the next hand? It depends how many, how many chips you had left. Yeah, I think, to be honest, ace eight suited. When people think you're, you're steaming, is not a hand to uh, put your tournament life on the line with. If, if you've only got two or three blinds or four blinds, maybe, but if you had if you had more. People think you're tilting, so they'll call you with ace-jack, expecting to see ace-eight, and on that occasion they would have been right. Of course, the ace is nothing you could do. It was a dream situation for you to get your chips all in the middle there, but unlucky. There you go, aces get cracked. Uh, interesting, you may hear from Chad. Good morning to you, Chad. He says, hi guys, great show. I have been thinking of asking my golf club permission to organise a poker night tournament. What are the legal implications of the, for the club <laughs> if they agree to host this? Talk to Barry Martin about that one. Um, the, the, the rules, as far as I understand it, they are up for grabs, the rules of um, what, what you can do in terms of holding poker tournaments, which is why um, Barry's club, the Gutshot Club, is uh, currently in a tussle with the law, but we're sure they will win. Basically, the rule is that you can run it, providing you're not making um, a big profit from it. You can take reasonable expenses for running the tournament, but you certainly shouldn't be uh, making any money, any serious money on it. There you go. Mm. Sue me if I'm wrong. 
Uh, okay, well, we're going to have a look at the new What's in the Hole? And uh, without Trev's theme tune. Which How does it go brilliant. roughly? It goes, What's in the hole? What's in the hole? What's in the hole? What's in the hole? And it kind of goes on like that for a while, and then at the end, there's a climax. Brilliant. Might need a bit of work on the lyrics. <laughs> Okay, right, LL Coolio, what does he have in his hole? You need to work this out by the betting patterns. It's a huge part of poker, you have to be able to read your opponent. <laughs> well, that could be anything. Uh, <laughs> we will, uh, <laughs> could be anything, you're right. Anyway, text yep. the words hole, and then your answer, and then your name to 62211. Yeah, don't text PNL like it said there because that's wrong. Definitely that's wrong. whole. Definitely whole. Yeah. And each month, the most consistent people that get it right will win a prize. Order of the whole. So what could it be? Right. Should we go to cash game? Well, I don't really mind. Okay, cash game it is. Doc doesn't mind. What's going on here then, Doc? Well, there's eight guys playing poker for money. Texas Hold'em. Texas Hold'em No Limit. It's on the internet. Sophie Viney. May or may not be a porn star, we're not sure. Smooth Cuts are regular. Snap It's regular. In fact, we saw most of these guys earlier. Swan Lee has waned. And our current chip leader by a hair's breadth is Gullo. Well, not a hair's breadth. More of an afro's breadth. And the ace takes it down. In a cash game, yeah. is it more important to be thinking about your odds more? That's a good question, Michelle. Thank I would you. say that poker is always about odds, even if it's just uh, how likely are they to fold here. But, um, hmm... I don't know, it's a six and two threes, really, because in cash games, you, you more often encounter situations where you're looking for implied odds because you've got a big stack compared to the blinds. So you make a call which makes no sense in terms of odds, but you think either you can get paid big time if you catch your hand or you've got a sufficiently big stack that you can outplay your opponents on the flop or the turn. So you bend the odds in cash games for that reason. Uh, likewise, in tournaments... Often you're not really interested in, in the value of your hand relative to your opponents. You're interested in the likelihood of them folding. But then you're still, um, in the back of your mind, you're still saying, well, if I am called, what sort of shape am I going to be in with this stealing hand? So mm -hmm. I think I would say, on the face of it, you're actually more interested uh, in odds, in straightforward pot odds, in a tournament. Because you're, you're looking at, where am I if I'm called, plus how likely is he to fold? Okay. So everything's a semi-bluff in that sense in a tournament. And what about stealing the blinds in a cash game? Still something you need to have a pop at every now and then? Yeah, but you do it for a slightly different reason. In a, in a tournament, you've got to nick the blinds to keep yourself alive. In a cash game, um, provided people didn't play against you differently, regardless of how often you stole the blinds, you might be able to make yourself a winner just by waiting for big cards. The reason why you have to steal blinds in a cash game is to maintain your table image, because if you never, ever nick the blinds, people know you've got a hand when you bet. Mm. So it's nice if you pick up a bit of money by nicking the blinds in the cash game, but the best reason for doing it is just to stop them thinking you're a rock if you are a rock. Oh, it's me. It, it does feel great when you're in a cash game, for instance, and you, uh, and you go for that bluff and it works and everyone folds to you. It is a good feeling. Really good feeling. You like nicking people's blinds, Michelle? <laughs> we certainly do. You're but lucky. more than that, I like being in a pot with a lot of money in it and not hitting my hand and being able to take it still. That's even better feeling. Hang on a minute. You like uh, losing money but not minding losing money? No. I like, I like it even better when you're in a pot saying it's like the turn. Yeah. And you haven't got a hand. Yeah. But there's quite a lot of money in the pot. Yeah. But well, you do have a hand but it's not great and it's probably easily beaten. Yeah. Um, but then you, you, you put in a big bet and take it down. Oh, OK. Oh, now I'm on your wavelength. Yeah. Mm. That is the best feeling. So and it's really, even now, I get really nervous. I'm in my head, I'm going, oh, don't call, don't call. 
And do you think um, that those nerves will be visible if you play in a live game and make the same moves? Well, I would, I would usually say yes, but the times I have played live, I've done really well. In fact, I haven't played many live games, but I've got into the money on all of them but one. And all those games have been against you lot. <laughs> and did you bluff much? I know you weren't bluffing with the Kings. Not that much, no. Mm. But it's been a while since I played a live game. That's not including my home games with my parents. I can't read my mum for the life of me, and she usually ends up beating me. Oh dear. <laughs> I know, it's terrible. She doesn't even know what she's doing. She doesn't watch Poker Night Live. <laughs> no, they're on holiday at the moment. To bed you go. Well, for some. Hmm, got a player there in seat five called Tatfwat. Where do you think he's from? Um, why would I know where he's from? Well, I just wonder what, what nation people are called Tatfwat. Do you think he's from Tobago? I think it's a little bit of a play on words. Ah. Lord Libra, smooth cuts in there. Gollo, snap it. Emma Cosgrave's still there, and we've got Dead Man at the top. Tat looking for a six. But it's not entirely bomb-proof for six there. It does make nine, ten a straight. And uh, lots of cards there that will make a straight on the river. So he disappears from the pots. OK, well, we'll leave it there. I have an email here from the Welsh Demon. Ooh. I wonder if that's Robinson. He says, good evening, Dr. Tom and Michelle. I hope you're both well. I am. Are you well? Yeah, super. Thanks, uh, Welsh Demon. I've got an interesting live game coming up, and I wonder if you can help. A group of friends are going to play some poker tourneys just for fun. Half of them haven't even played much poker. They just know the basics. Others who are participating are your basic low-stake internet players such as myself and a couple who consider themselves strong players. Taking into account such a wide range of player abilities, what strategy would you advise I employ against such opponents? The games would probably be long hand. Any help would be greatly appreciated. Oh, by the way, I think that I, I already had an advantage in that I watched Poker Night Live. But any more help you can give for this situation would be great. Yeah, that's a very interesting question. Thanks for that, Welsh Demon. Um, basically, you can't really know sh for sure who's going to end up in the pot with you. You can take some sorts of steps to, uh, to, take, to make the pot the way that it is. For example, if there's someone there who's, who likes to call a certain size bet but won't call a bigger bet, uh, but there's another player who will call a big bet, it naturally follows that you can isolate the, the second player by putting in a certain size bet. I wouldn't worry too much uh, about that aspect of it because uh, to a certain extent you can't control who's going to come into the pot with you. But once people are in the pot with you, then of course play according to what you expect them to do. If they're players who don't really know what they're doing, expect them to be passive which means that they tend to call but not bet. That means you don't bluff them. It does mean that you can play with funny sorts of hands that need time to develop, like suited connectors, because if they don't bet at you, they're more likely to let you see the river card for free and the turn and the river card for free. So play each hand according to who is, um, in, who's going to be in the, in the pot with you eventually. Um, you might be able to choose seating arrangements to suit you. I think you probably want the people who consider themselves to be players to be on your right so you have position on them. There's my tips. Thanks, John. And uh, John, thanks, Tom. And we have an email from John here. He says, Dear Tom and Michelle, great show as always. Very unlucky with the bullets, Michelle. Better luck next time, as long as I'm not playing. That's fair enough. Thank you. He says, With regard to Kev's tactics, mm. um, most of the time, the other player will just re-raise you the other chip, so it nearly always becomes a moot point. Very good point. But, of course, sometimes he won't. Sometimes he won't. Because poker players are lazy and it's, it's slightly easier to, to press call than, than... Well, it's not actually easier to press call than raise at all, <laughs> so they have to be spectacularly lazy. I'm still going to have a think about it, though. I think there's room for an optimal strategy there. OK, well, uh, we can have another email, I think, or some questions, and then a break. So we see you then.
Okay, and Dr. Tom, there's many questions that we answer here on Poker Night Live. Um, we do talk a lot about how to play the game, um, the game of Texas Hold'em. We talk a lot about how you can improve on your game and how you can become a winning player. Um, but there's a lot of guys and girls out there that want to take poker one step further and actually want to make a living at poker. Now, this is actually obviously much harder to do in reality. Um, but have you got any advice or tips to people that think they're good enough to take that extra step to become a professional poker, if they're, poker player if there is such a thing? Sure, I've got, I've got lots of tips. None of them are much fun and are the sort of things that you'd expect a serious grown-up to say, mm -hmm. but I feel duty-bound to say them. A uh, number of things to consider here. One is simply that you probably, well not probably, you certainly won't enjoy poker as much if you play it for a living. Now any, any pro will tell you that. Partly because you're playing it a lot more than you are if you're playing just as a recreational player. So you see it all, you know, you cease to be surprised by what's happening. It's all just about putting bread on the table. Secondly, it's a lot more scary playing for money that you can't afford to lose. If you've got a sensible job, a serious job that pays your salary every month and you're making money on top of that, suddenly you feel like you're on top of the world, you can beat this game, hunky-dory, everything's sunny and rosy. But Everyone at some point in their time, either as a pro or a semi-professional player or just a recreational player, will encounter a massive, horrible losing run. <clears throat> now, if you're just playing for fun, it's not much fun. It's very annoying. It makes your, your um, poker tracker stats look a bit rubbish. But the fact is you can still eat because you've still got a job. But if you're losing money mm -hmm. through no fault of your own, just because you keep getting outdrawn, that is horrible. It's unbelievably horrible and you just don't know how to get out of it because in the end, poker has plenty of luck in it and all you need to do is catch a very, very bad run and it can wipe you out. And just the prospect of that mm -hmm. is really pretty horrible. Well, these bad runs that you talk about, I mean, we, we talk about poker and we say you are going to have bad runs and you're going to have good runs. Um, now, each time you play the game of poker, it's completely random, the cards you're going to get. Um, so these bad runs that you hit, is it just equally as possible that you're never going to hit a bad run and you can carry on playing your same game? I mean, what, what advice have you got to people that have ups and downs? Is it always going to be swings and roundabouts? And how do you deal with it? Basically, the longer you, pl the longer you play, the longer the run of bad luck you can expect to be. So if you play for a short while, you don't expect a massive long run uh, of bad luck. But if you play for 10 years, there's going to be some opportunity for you to have a really, really bad run. Now, if you're considering taking up poker as a career, we assume it's not in the short term, it's the long term. So you're going to have to face somewhere down the line that kind of possibility. And this is why poker players establish lines of credit, should we say, with each other, so that if they do bust out, they can either get back into action fairly quickly mm -hmm. or at least survive while they're in poker hospital. <laughs> the other thing I would like to say about uh, going pro is you need a very, very sound reason to think that you are beating the game. There are many, many, many players out there who believe they can beat the game on the basis of their best week so far. They say, in that week, I won $4,000, and they mentally say, well, I can win $4,000 each week. Now, a few weeks later, they might lose 3500 Now they're making $250 across two weeks. doesn't look quite so good anymore. And you'll see people, don't be, ever be worried about the size of your, uh, your bankroll compared to other people's when um, they've had a, a good run because they'll be very quiet a few weeks later when you ask them how they're doing at the tables and they say, oh yeah, okay. Take that vagueness as a sign that they've had a particularly bad run and they've wiped out most of their profit. So I would invest in uh, some sort of uh, poker analyzing software unless you are scrupulous and honest enough to be absolutely religious about keeping records about how much you win and lose because unless you have those completely sound, reliable records about how much you've won and lost, then uh, you have no real sure basis for knowing whether you can beat this game in the long run. And as I say, most people tend to view their abilities on the back of their best run rather than an average run. So, uh, as I said, grown-up advice, say, Michelle, not yeah, much fun. Yeah, very grown-up advice. But, I mean, a lot of the poker sites will keep a track on your wins and losses anyway, won't they? That's right, yeah. If you're doing it all on the internet, then, of course, then your credit card statements do not lie. But um, why not just play for fun for a bit, bit longer? Excellent. Well, thank you, Dr. Tom. Um, we're going to be taking a break now. Um, as I said before, don't go anywhere. The Doc and I will return after this.
Good morning, welcome back to Poker Night Live. Dr. Tom and I are special. We've had a very interesting evening so far, and we're going to start off with the new what's in the hole. Here we go. It's very relaxing music, didn't it? Not as good as Trev, though. What do you think's in the hole, uh, Michelle? Well, we don't really have much information, do we? He just kind of pushes all in, doesn't he? So it could be anything. We need we need one with a bit more play going on, I think, for tomorrow, maybe. Well, he, i tell you what, he is raising somebody who's raised six times the big blinds. Well, it's going to be something like kings. I don't know. I don't Take, know you know, text the word hole in your answer to six double two double one. Uh, we do have um, an email, but I think I'll do this is from Steve Barrog. We'll do it over the multi-table tournament, so we'll go over there and then I'll do this over top of it. So that way you can see what's going on. Oop, I've just clicked on Could the I just one. mention, I just logged into the forum and we're getting some extraordinary postings from Cass. Yes. I think he's been on Something, the Mad Dog. I think he's been on, uh, been on the booze. Check it out. Go on the forum. It's under... Um, J Kicker K is the thread. Question for P&L presenters. Very, very odd. Casper, call us. What are you on? So we're back on the multi-table tourney. Uh, I've just got this email from Steve, oh, because I said I'd do it. He says, morning, Michelle and Tom. He wanted to talk to us about the bubble thing. Um, he says, a big blind was low stacked, and the blinds were 320 and 640. And being big blind has me all in but for 140 chips. So raise from solid um, player hoofy. I have 5-2 offsuit. Odds I have. I also know I will be behind. He's having had to raise through... Um, the other two players to get to me and while he can do it with anything at that stage I'm certain that I am behind. If I fold the small blind puts me all in next hand anyway however if I were to survive the small blind it would possibly allow one of the other three to go out. As it happens I called and I lost. But would taking a chance on the small blind have been the thing to do it being the bubble and all that? I don't know it's a perennial question there's so much you don't know. I do think there to be honest that uh, decides it one way or another but uh, yeah I mean at least you're asking the right question Steve. Right, so this is our final table, is it? We have Ristox, Elsa Cat, Uratep, Nash Pro, Madman, Ace Turf, and Skynet. So they've all come a long, long way. Playing all night, and this is the very final table, so our last seven players. So who will take it? Moment, we don't know. I mean, the stacks. Nash Pro, they're well ahead. Uh, Ace, Ace Turf, even further ahead than that. Ristock's all in now. He doesn't have much. He's got some work to do. Uh, Madman there has some work to do. But the winner here is going to be taking away $732. There's lots to play for. Seventh will be taking away $85. Good money. It is good money. I mean, what do you have to do at this stage of the tournament? You're on the very last table. Is it just to, is it a, there's still a lot of play left, I suppose, because the blinds are only 1,000, 2,000. Um, but because it's a full table, I, do you have to play it just as you would a sit and go? No, because the blinds get up much slower. So you can, okay. um, if you've got, say, six or seven big blinds, um, you're in much the same situation. But uh, you can very possibly climb considerably further up the uh, the prize ladder just by playing a tight game. I'm not necessarily recommending that, but in the sit and go, then uh, you've got much less time to acquire chips. Well, what do we have here? A pair of nines. Uh, we've got a couple of rag aces there. Might decide it's enough to come in. Let's have a look see if they do. Uh, Ace Turf having a little think about this. There are those nines again. There's that minimum raise. Well, it's not the worst flop in the world for the nines. I mean, the jack's there. Yeah, Tip, treading carefully. 10,000 in the pot. He puts in slightly less than a pot size bet. 
And I'd be delighted to see a fold there. Even Madman, who we saw earlier, has still got uh, ten big blinds. And at this stage in a, in a multi-table tourney, you see relatively few flops. No one's got the long implied odds they need just to call, hoping to catch. And no one is so short stacked that they're forced to play with marginal cards. When there's lots of people with 10 to 20 big blinds, this is the sort of play we see, very few flops dealt. Okay, uh, King 5 here for Nash Pro. Bit of a raise, it's a steal and it's worked. King Jack. On the big blind, there's nothing here to contest it actually, but uh, does Ave Turf want to go for a bluffy steal? No, it's folded round to him. So, still six left. Sixth place will be taking $122. Ace King for Madman. How does he play it? Eight, 8,000 raise, four times the big blind. Got a rag ace, we've got a jack queen, an 8 9. Is the uh, is Ace Turf going to think about coming in here? If he does, he's very much dominated. No, he doesn't. Not quite worth it at this stage. I don't. Will the eight nine? No. So he takes it down. Um, so yeah, sixth place is going to take one hundred twenty-two dollars. Fifth, one hundred fifty-eight dollars. Fourth, one hundred ninety-five. Third, two hundred ninety-two. Second, four hundred seventy-five. And first, seven hundred thirty-two. So there's a lot to play for still. Um, if you go out now, um, it will cost you about six hundred dollars if you were to go on to win. Um, and the blind's only one thousand, two thousand. So a lot of play. And we're going to be seeing people uh, not wanting to go out. We might see some people being a little bit tricky. So maybe now is the time to be aggressive. No, folded around all the way again to the raise. Queen nine. So this is a multi-table tournament. It's been happening all night. There originally was 244 people and 366,000 chips in play. The blinds were 12 minute blinds and the top 20 places were paid and $2,440 altogether. So about 30 tables-ish, I think. And now we're all down to one. Multi-table tournament, so it's exactly the same as any tournament, and the tables are condensed as people are knocked out. There's those aces. And what is there in store? Not much, as it happens. Jack nine suited, coming in for a little mini three times there. And that will probably force Elsa out. Eartep calling for the uh, two to one odd set. Nice flop. Ooh, and up, up and, and down. down as well. It's an eight. What does Zyatep do? Does he just call? I mean, he doesn't have to be too worried here, does he? At the moment. Rainbow flop. Aye, aye. And that's it. He's been outdrawn. He's got the redraw that's to the house. nasty. Ten he out. the board to pair. It's unfortunate for the eights there. Do you know what? He's getting odds. Oh, no, but he's now made it difficult for himself. Well, he's going to have to go all in and catch something other than the king. Doesn't happen. So he goes out sixth. Unfortunate for our tap there. Oh, well, he got paid. He got paid. He certainly did. 
How much Six did he get paid? Six position is 122. Not bad at all. Five players remain then, and uh, they're fighting for $158. Well, they're not fighting for it at all. That's what they're assured. They're fighting for fourth place, which is 195 And as the number of players reduces, they must downgrade their hands because the blinds are coming around more and more often. So they can't afford to wait for big hands. Oh, there they are again. Has anyone's aces apart from yours been cracked tonight, Michelle? No. Oh. That's typical for you, isn't it? And a big chip lead here for Nash Pro. Ace Turf's about 50 behind. It was straight what done it. Who will be next to bite at the dust? Jack suited, madman. Might see this as an opportunity to move. I quite like that bet, actually. Depending on who raises me, I might fold. I'll probably call most people, but it might encourage people to uh, to raise me with a worse hand than Ace Jack. Now Ace Ten's got significantly more chips. And pushes, big push there, very big push. Still, with only five players left, Ace Ten is not a terrible hand. And four players to act behind. No dangers there. There they are again. This is unbelievable. And us, the cat's almost certainly going to bet with 10 jack suited. There it is, four times. Nash Pro has a look at Elsa Cat's chips and looks at the values for uh, slow playing it, Decide, decides there aren't that many good reasons to let Elsa Cat see the flop cheaply, and now she will get away from it. Nash Pro hoping that she's got, or he's got Ace King, maybe Ace Queen suited, he might come in with maybe a pair. But 10 jack, I'm pretty sure. He can let go. We can't see here whether or not Nash Pro showed his aces there, but uh, probably the best thing to do would be not to show them. Now there is the ace king. Another 12. Oh, yeah. Not a terrible bet. There's a chance someone will think that he's on tilt or she's on tilt. And cool. Four slightly ahead. And there it is. It was a close from thing. They had almost the same amount of chips. Elsa Cat is out. Ace 10 again. Just the min. Oh, and it works. And Skynet will have logged that in his uh, back of his head. Nash Pro is prepared to fold for a minimum raise in the big blind against the small blind. Good enough for a raise, king nine suited. There it is, three times, keeping it constant. Now was not the time to fight back for Madman, and he's aware now that with a, a stack that small, people are looking for him to be the next one to go out. And the smaller that stack gets, the more likely he is to be called. Because players know that by calling him, they have two um, possible sources of equity. They might win the pot and take the chips. 
and that uh, possibility <coughs> increases their chances of moving up the prize ladder. If they take 21,000 chips off someone else, sure, they might eventually take that player out and move up the prize ladder, but it's going to have to be done by instalments. Well, obviously, usually this would be the bubble situation, uh, but this time it's not, because even if you do go out fourth, you still walk away with $195. Happy days. You know which isn't bad? For your 10? Almost as good value as, uh, as texting the show, which is four for a pound. But the, Sorry. It's very good. <laughs> very good value there. <laughs> you can't beat that, really, was what I was <laughs> trying to say there. But instead mm. you said... Uh, but, uh. Instead I went... Mm. Oh, well. Queen, nine pair of fours with Skynet. Ooh. Uh, didn't think it was good enough to uh, put in a big raise. Which may have taken it off Ace Turf. Um, and now he's been taken by Ace with a lesser hand. Okay, do you remember if you've got anything you'd like to ask? Oh, as Skynet gets the bullets. You can text 62211. Any comments or questions, we'll try and get them in before the end of the show. And there's the email, poker at pokernightlive.co.uk. And there's a the number. Have your say. 0906 200 Okay, the ace is raised. Re-raise. Ace turf puts his ace ten down. Realizes he's beat. Queen Jack for Skynet. Does he put in a just a call? He limps with the Queen Jack. And uh, Madman now has hit his ace. And the gut shot. He's not going to get paid, though. Queen's face turf takes it down. Nine ten, the sky net. King Queen. Some action from King Six. Unfortunately, uh, didn't pick the right moment to go for a steal, I don't think. Unbeknowing to him, of course. May have been the perfect time for a steal. Uh, but he might still take it, because Madman doesn't actually have anything. And Nash Pro was the one to initially raise, so he does have to be slightly wary. May well put this down. Unless he tries to steal it back off him by pushing all in, which he does. And now Nash Pro probably has to put it down. He calls. Only a six will save him. It doesn't come. So Madman doubles through. Bullets for Sky. I can't see he's going to get any action off the others. Nash Pro may want to come in with the rag. He doesn't make it expensive. And he checks it. He's slow playing the aces. Raise from Nash Pro. That's what Skynet wanted to see. Huge raise. Nash Pro can't call this. But it does. How much more is he going to pay? Oof. And still the aces haven't been cracked. I know, except for mine, of course. Unbelievable. That's just typical. It's been forehanded for a while. Still plenty of play here. Madman sitting there with uh, 15 big blinds. Jacks, nice. And this looks like it is it. We've had one more casualty. Ace Turf bites the dust. For, uh, fourth, he does go away with $195. 
Nice flop. Just a shame that uh, Nash Pro is sitting unbelievably with two undercards to those cards. He does put in a pop. Oh, golly, what's going on here? He's gone off the rails. Now he can fold. Have the decency to dwell up there, Nash Pro, and pretend you had a decent hand. Save yourself a bit of face. Well, I suppose when you know it's going to be televised, anyway, there's no point. Mm -hmm. And Sky now on a roll. Madman, watching these two play against each other, might feel there's some mileage in just keeping out of the way. Here's a short stack, but if there's a chance that one of them will knock the other one out, i.e. Skynet, then that's a great situation to be in as a small stack. Power of the draw in shorthanded poker. And now, let's see what Madman's strategy is. Yeah, I don't blame him. He lets that one go. Well, only three left, so it's really going to be a battle now. Absolute filth. And still, yeah, I've got a feeling that was going to be too small for him. He's waiting for a decent hand or a chance to see Nash Pro get knocked out. I like his strategy. But unfortunately, Nash Pro is growing, not dwindling. And Madman will have to make a move soon now. Very nice to get a walk in that situation. Back up to 41. Well, Skynet in the depth, hugely in the lead here. But uh, Madman's got some work to do. So what can we, does Madman just have to push in here? Unfortunately, Nash Pro seems to be uh, accumulating chips. So he's looking for a hand to double through with, or there's still room for him to, to nick, but he knows he's more likely to get called. People are going to want to put the pressure on him. He's in a difficult situation, and Ace-9 suited here. He might decide to play this for all his chips. He might decide that that is an attempt to nick, and that is exactly what he's decided. But he's got outs here. Ace or a spade? Nah. He's gone. Well, Nash Pro pops. takes him out. Third, which is $292. And let's see how the heads up game is played out. Both players have a pair, and it's the back and forth little raises that we've seen for some time between these two players. And it really could go either way here. And certainly Chip's going to go into the pot now. Here comes the raise, I think. Now, is Skynet going to work out where he is? Big call. Big raise from Skynet and a big call from Nash. Queen is hit. And Nash is now down to four big blinds. And it will all go in, I've got a feeling. <laughs> Maybe not on this hand. But very soon. Oh, he flat calls. Very interesting. I kind of work out why I did that. I think he knew he was going to get called if he raised. But he thought with three to one, if he called, his opponent might not raise him. And he was seeing the flop. There it is. Well done, boys. And uh, so second is four hundred and seventy-five, and the winner takes seven hundred and thirty-two. Ooh la la! Ooh la la! That is marvellous. So, what did you think of that play on that final table, Doc? Um, it was very interesting. I, I liked the situation where Madman was uh, was sort of playing it a bit coy while he had two players who might build a big pot against each other. Mm -hmm. So, um, shame we didn't get to see him play for longer. Never mind, third place, not bad.
No, not at all. Quite a quick heads up game there as well. Yeah. Um, okay, well, we have an email here from Mr. Giza. Oh, yeah. Morning to you, Mr. Giza. I've had a few texts in from him before, actually, and uh, and usually quite interesting. Um, okay. What does he say? <laughs> I'm just filling as I'm waiting for my <laughs> slow computer to catch up. Yeah, but what does he say? Come on, Michelle, we've got no All time. Right, he says, right, I'm ready. Okay. He says, I went gambling, £20 buy in at Asper's. Wish I had a live chat box shut off. I was chatting a lot and winning. They all complained and pushed me out of the tourney. Tourney, with no verbal allowed. It upset my apple cart. Hmm. Mm, I think you should have read that out in, in Cockney. I mean, I know. Go on, then, you do it in Cockney. Um, well, you know, you're the anchor, you no, do the come accents. On. I went gambling, £20 buying at Aspers. I wish I had a live chat box shut off. I was chatting a lot and winning. They all complained and pushed me out the tour with no verbal allowed. It upset my apple cart. That was wonderful. Thank Dr. you. Tom, wonderful. <laughs> Thank you you are lost. Why are you not in Hollywood movies? Snatch I'm watching needed it. you. Uh, if I'm not here, what, sorry? Tip top. <laughs> oh, OK, I misheard you there. Snatch. Um, yeah, the movie got you. Uh, although, strangely, Aspers is in, uh, in Geordie Land. So, Casper would know about Aspers. Casper Aspers. Well, Casper's being a bit weird on the forum still, so. He is. Waffling a lot about goats. I think we should tell the producers he's probably not safe to be let into the studio at the moment. <laughs> um, so, what do you reckon to finish off the, the night? A cash game? Yeah, let's head to a cash game. <laughs> Thanks, Doc. <laughs> well, we've got Sophie Viney still playing. Robolido, Smooth Cut, Gullo, Tat. Oh, look at that. I can't see anymore. Uh, tat Fwat, Smooth Cut, Robolido, Oakhurst. Hmm. Good Gullo. Chip Leader. W Doctor. Okay, so we're back in our 25.50 cash game. And Ace King here. What does he do with it? Well, he hasn't got anything, but then either has W Doctor. King Ten. Pair of twos. Um, we've spoken about these small pairs tonight already, and it looks like definitely limping seems to be the way to go. Five players taking a flop. Anything could happen. Strangely, though, almost nothing is going to happen with that board. No one's really connected significantly. What do you think, Michelle? Four players in it? Is it all going to kick off? <coughs> Yep. We've got uh, gut shots for Oakhurst. We've got the jacks, excuse me, um, for smooth cut. W Doctor there. Not much. Ooh, a bet from W Doctor might actually get rid of the others. And it does. Look at that. Look at that. Queen eight. Does he come in or does he put it down? Puts it down, correct. The ace queen here, does he fancy a raise or is he just going to limp? He raises to three. I think he will get a call from the nines. Not a bad flop for the nines. Oh, and then comes the ten. It's not bad for him. It's seven, eight, nine, ten. So he does have the up and down now. Robolido makes the bet without actually hitting anything on the board. A two pair now for Oakhurst, and he takes it down. Wouldn't have got any more money from Robolido there. And it, Robolido gets the ace queen again. 
Um, what does he do with the Ace Queen this time? Let's have a look. <laughs> Makes in the bet two dollars. It's called by seven ten suited. Let's see how that works out for him. He's hit the seven, so he is ahead of the Ace Queen at the moment. Does he make a bet though? Yes, he does. Romolido here. Can't. Oh, he goes all in. And is what can my Cosgrave do now? He's only got a pair of sevens. No diamonds there to save him. He's got to put Romolido. On a, on a good hand, because he was the one to raise it pre-flop. It's true, unless he, he puts on ace-queen or ace-king. But he does fold. It's the next case, and uh, lots of players coming into these pots. And once one group of the table starts, one part of the table starts calling, and the rest of them will as well, because they're coming in for those uh, nice long pot odds. Once two or three limpers have come in, then you can call with all sorts of hands. You've got position and a nice pot. Thanks, Doc. You're welcome. That's what I'm here for. Mm -hmm. And four players take flop. Far too many, in my opinion. But there you go. No flush for anyone? Oh, no one's hit at all. Oh, except for the nines. Whatever you, Doctor. Jack King's come along. Oh, no, he's got Jack. Oh, look at me missing everything, Doc. Easily done, Michelle. Easily <laughs> it is, done. isn't it? I've got a lot of sympathy for you. <laughs> Thanks. It's got to be scared of all those spades. And there she is, Sophie Viney with a pair of ladies to keep her company. And they're the classic, four times the big blind under the gun raise. Could mean anything. Oh. Uh, set queen. Top set. It's the always nuts. nice. Just the spades are a bit of a cloud on the horizon. And she's going to have to raise, I think, just in case those are a couple of spades. Sort of thing that uh, a big blind might have, a couple of spades. Oh. Ooh, so slightly more, but then he has the queen of spades, so he's That's quite right. nice, really. It's only the ace of king. If another spade come, they would have to be worried about. That's right. Queen's probably feeling relatively safe here, but the possibility of a flush might be enough to dampen her betting Zeal, apparently not, bets, but gets no more chips in the pot. A pair of sevens, a pair of queens, and an ace king. A pair of sevens calls it. Queen, set queens again, Doc. For the second time in less than four minutes. It must be rigged. Never. You do see this though, don't you? This does happen. People text us in saying, oh, somebody had aces four times in a row. How can this be? Well, you've got to remember, each time the cards are dealt, it starts from a blank canvas, so anything can happen. That's right. It doesn't matter if three of them come, three, um, oh, well, if three aces come, then probably it is rigged. But if you get three lots of pairs of aces, then the chance of getting another pair is exactly the same as it was at the start, 220 to 1 against. Just herd up them good cards. Herd them up, as if they were... Cattle. Cattle. Well, interesting analogy. Mm. Well, there's no queens there. Oh, ace queen for W, Doctor. Be interesting to see another set, although Robolido does have a queen in his other hand as well. Not a bad flop for which Doctor? How many outs? Well, he's got the clubs. There's one. 
He's got the jack and possibly the ace as an out as well, although you can't guarantee it. As it happens, he was ahead anyway. And although the club is nice, the jack would have been even nicer because it, it would have made him a uh, straight and it would have made Robolido a worse straight, which is a situation you want to be in. Nuts flush for W Doctor. Nice. Not going to get paid. Two, three, four, five for W Doctor. What do we have here? A pair of sixes? Oh, we have the seven eight for Gullo. Massive. Yep. Well, it is against sixes. Pretty much a coin flip. And there it is, the eight came. Gallo would have outdrawn the sixes. And in fact, he would have been dominating Witch Doctor, which is a bit of a feat with seven, eight. But it's all about the flush draw for Sophie Viney. Still not there. Move on the river. Ten seventy five in the pot. He's got a pair, he's got the flush draw. Oh well, he's done it the hard way, he's made trips on the river. Will he get paid by W Doctor with his Eight though. Now the board is paired. W Doctor's got to be slightly worried. There is an over card out there as well. Trouble is, he might correctly have put Sophie Viney on the flush draw, and uh, if she bets, decide that she's bluffing it. Yeah, he does. That. King Queen, Jack Ten. Remember, we're watching a cash game, so the money in front of them is the actual money they're playing with. Uh, minimum you can sit down with is five, ten times big blind. At this, in this case, would be five dollars, and uh, the maximum you can sit down with is a hundred times of the big blind, which would be fifty dollars. You can sit down with whatever you please in between that, and you can come and go as you wish. You just find a table with an empty seat and sit yourself down. You make it all sound so lovely. Do I? Yes. Aww. It is lovely. I mean, well, well until you do your money. Unless your aces get cracked, of course. Yep. Which doctor again stood in there with a pretty mediocre pair, but that doesn't seem to have daunted his spirit. Puts in 3875, wins of $7. Fours from W Doctor. He had fours earlier actually and he limped. Let's see if he does the same again. Decides. Oh, still deciding. So he limps in again. It doesn't get a set. Two over cards. We can see one of those fours is in Oakhurst's hand. Uh, I think first bet will probably take this. Sophie there has uh, up and down. 
small little limpy bet for Oakhurst to always decide to come along for the ride. A little raise for Sophie with the up and down. Fours might quite like this now. Just check, check. I'm sure I'll be happy with that result. Ooh, as the Cowboys are dealt to M Cosgrove. Cowboys in the small blinds. Well, they are strong enough for you not to be so concerned about the evils of being in the small blinds. Danger though, there's the flush draw. Hmm, and in the end, the price which Doctor was getting was not very good. Ah, uh, well, he's out. Cosgrove more or less doubles through. Is he coming back for more? Time to take a stats break. Oh, well. Smooth cut at the top there. Tat at the bottom. So 53% of pounds won. Smooth cut, not bad. Not bad at all. Has not he bad won at all. more than he's lost? Well, exactly, yeah, this is the thing. Is, uh, you just need to win, lose one big one, and that stat doesn't really mean much. Neither player connects here. And the power of position, I'm fairly sure, is going to reveal itself with a fold from Sophie. Now, 8-9 suited when there's a limper is a different sort of hand. Yeah, now he's playing this hand for, for implied odds. Well, not a limper, it curse puts in the minimum raise. There are those fours again. Then pesky fours. And no joy for Cosgrove or Oakhurst. They've both missed their, their long shot. Not sure what Tufnell was hoping for. position that can be let go. Likewise 8-9 off I think. However Tufnell comes again behind with a, uh, a weakish hand, Jack-9 off. It's horrible when you're trying to limp in with a hand pre-flop and then someone raises it right up and you have to put it down. Yep. Yeah. And but sometimes it's easier to do that than decide to call the raise with a, a hand that's not going to be as good. But if it keeps happening to you, then uh, there's no point being surprised about it. You've just got to put those marginal hands down because you're going to lose money in the long run by getting pushed off them like that. He's got seven, so two pair. He's beating everybody else at the moment. I uh, don't think he's going to get called here. No, takes it down. <clears throat> Five's come out to play. That's a very nice way to put it, Michelle. Yes. <clears throat> I do try. Ooh, not a good flop for fives. They go back into the Great pen. flop for Oakhurst. Couldn't get much better. But is he going to get paid? Because people are going to be scared of that flop and no one's really got anything to contest him. If someone had an ace, maybe, or a, or a pair of kings or something. No, only a nutter would raise there with nothing. <clears throat> Well, 
One last chance to get aces cracked. Seeing jacks get cracked just isn't the same. Well, ace queen, jack ten, jacks. We might see a bit more action in this pot. Oh, ace nine looks like it's coming in as well. Wow, made the bet. Ooh, it's probably good to raise there really because jacks want to really get rid of everybody, don't they? Make it yeah. heads up if possible. <clears throat> if not, take it down there and then. Gulo's getting nice odds there, but yeah, he's just scared about being dominated by Ace King, and Ace King and the small blind will behave just like that. I don't blame him for folding at all. <clears throat> King Queen limps. I think this is going to have to be our last hand, Doc. We're not going to see Aces cracked again. No. Nope. Okay. I think we've seen enough of aces tonight. And um, uh, it's all over. It's all over. It is all over, though. That's the end. Um, do we have an email from Christian quickly? Um, he says, Hi, Michelle and Tom. I've been playing for about six months now on the micro limit tables. Been 510. Sent. I've slowly worked my way up from ten dollars to six hundred dollars. Wow! <laughs> That's amazing. Now I seem to lose the majority of the pot through bad beats, which is slowly breaking my poker heart. At this point, what limits do you think I should be playing? As I am still hesitant to move up too high, too fast. I've been watching now for a few months, and I may say, what a great job yourselves and the rest of the Poker Night Live crew do. Hope to hear from you soon. Oh, thanks, Christian. If you've got if you've got five cent, uh, if you're playing a five cent, ten cent game, and you've got six hundred dollars. Then uh, there's absolutely no reason to feel you've got to move up to avoid those bad beats. I mean, you've got such a whopping bankroll uh, that uh, that can easily support the sort of variance you're going to encounter as a consequence of meeting players who play badly. So you're fine where you are. You don't have to move up uh, to find a, a game you can beat. You're fine where you are. Move up if you want to, by all means. But uh, your bankroll can handle the variance. Absolutely no problem there. Excellent, thanks, Doc. Well, let's have one last look at that what's in the hole before we go off air. Have a little... And what's do remember, if you think you know the answer, to write the, the word hole and then your answer and then your name, just six, double, two, double, one. And you have to tell us what you think LL Coolio has in his hand um, from the betting patterns. You see, Forks is a fairly sound player. OK, there we are. Um, OK, well, that is all we have time for tonight. Um, do remember, tomorrow night we have our multi-table tournament, Stan's Poker, um, $10 freeze out. Great stuff. I do believe it's yourself and the lovely Casper Berry tomorrow night, Dr. Tom. It is. It's always a pleasure and a privilege to work with Casper. So uh, I'd be interested to see how he feels about uh, poker tomorrow and other things. Uh, we do, of course, plumb the depths, as it were, of poker theory. It came out a bit wrong, but um, tune in for a pro night tomorrow night. How's it been for you tonight? A uh, very good night, actually. Obviously, a bit very disappointing sure. with the tournament, but again, I don't think I, I could have got away from it. So that's just how it goes. We've had some good poker. We have. I'm um, just going to be emails from all of you guys at home. So thanks a lot for that. We will be doing beat the potential tomorrow. I'm on. Um, I think Dr. Tom's playing tomorrow night. Excellent. So we'll really look forward to that. I think I might tune in for that actually. We'll try and sit down. Why not? About the same table? Yeah. Well, that could be interesting. That would be saucy. Yeah, give it a go, Michelle. You've got nothing better to do. OK, well, that is all we've got time for. Thanks for joining us. Do join us tomorrow night as well from 10pm on 843, as you know. Um, from Dr Tom and the Night Nurse, it is good night and goodbye. So give them a little wave, Doc. Bye-bye, viewers. <laughs> we'll see you tomorrow.